Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 2024 annual meeting of the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District. My name is Drew Mason, and I am the district moderator. I call this meeting to order. I ask all who are able to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please remain standing. The Hollis Brookline Honors Choir will be performing the national anthem. of Matt Barbosa. I'd like to take this opportunity to, to ask any uh, veterans or serving members of the armed forces to please stand and be recognized. We thank you for your service. I have a voting card and a ballot that appears to belong to Donna Brett Schneider. If you are here, you can claim your voting card and ballot from me. I've been asked to, to tell folks that babysitting services are available. They're provided by members of the National Honor Society uh, in the library, and if you have a small child um, there will be people out there to escort you. The services are available until 10. At this time, I'll ask School Board Chair Holly Durlow Babcock to introduce members of the school board. Good evening. Thank you all for coming. I'm Holly Durlow Babcock. I'm your School Board Chair, I'm joined by Kate Stoll, our Vice Chair, Beth Williams, our Secretary, Rob Mann, Tom Solon, Krista Whalen, and Cindy Van Conant. I invite, invite Budget Committee Chair Darlene Mann to introduce the members of the Budget Committee. 
Good evening, my name is Darlene Mann and the budget committee members um, this evening are Raul Blanchet, Tom Whalen, Brian Rader, Dave Blinn, Tony Stanizzi, Matt McGuire, and Tom Solon is our school board representative to the budget committee. I invite Superintendent Scorey, Superintendent Corey to introduce members of the administration. From the SAU, we have Gina Bergskog, Assistant Superintendent, Lauren DeGenero, Director of Student Services, Carol Tyler, Director of IT, Kelly Seeley, Business Manager, and Linda Sherwood, the Director of Operations, High School Principal Tim Grazone, Assistant Principal Yolanda Firmino, Assistant Principal Amanda Zella, and Assistant Principal in Special Ed is Aisha Weaver. From the middle school, we have Patrick West, principal, Catherine Ransom, director of special ed at the middle school, and Allie Bushman, assistant principal. Thank you for all coming out tonight. Helping me tonight, we have Matt Upton, who is our district council, Diane Levitt, who is our district clerk, with supervisors of the checklist and ballot clerks are along the back wall and I have assistants and counters who are collected over there in the corner. <clears throat> there are four fire exits in this room, two up front and two in the back. The fire department would like to remind you to please keep the exits clear. The video for this meeting is available to be live streamed um, it is available on sau41.org, and then you click on resources, and then you click on board meetings on demand. Also available from SAU 41 is the budget that we're voting on tonight, the meeting warrant, and this proposal. You can find those by clicking on resources, and then voter information, and then co-op, and then FY25 budget. You, if you have a tablet, you might find it easier to follow from the tablet than it is from uh, the screen here. This is the last meeting in this cycle. However, I want to bring up that we have a state primary coming up in September and a general election in November. The reason why I mention it, even though these are months away, is that after the presidential primary, we had quite a few people who registered from a change party from undeclared to one of the, either Republican or Democrat so that they could vote in that party and then didn't change back. If for any reason you wish to change your party affiliation, you can do that by visiting your town clerk or visiting a session of the supervisors of the checklist. We always get a few voters who come into a primary and said, I'm not a, a Democrat or I'm not a Republican, but sure enough, you still are. We are here tonight to discuss and act on the subjects brought forward on the warrant by your school board. To do so effectively, we need rules which provide order and structure to the business of the meeting. Rules must be set for each meeting so folks understand how to get things done. I will propose a set of rules and then ask voters to adopt them. Once adopted, it takes a two-thirds vote to change them. As a reminder, Robert's rules is only a guide. They do not control how this meeting is run. You can find a copy of my rules in the Hollis Town Report on page 235 and in the Brookline Town Report on page 208. In the next few slides, I will touch on just a few points. If you wish to speak, come up to the microphone and show your voting card. Please wait to be recognized by the moderator. This gym is not designed as a meeting hall, so it's sometimes very difficult to hear. Announce your name and address clearly so the clerk can hear it. If we don't understand it, we may ask you to repeat. 
You may speak only once until all other first-time speakers have had a chance. Your time is limited to two minutes and cannot be yielded or transferred to somewhere else. Sponsors of petition articles may have 10 minutes to present their arguments, and sponsors of amendments may have five. When you get close to your time limit, I will give you a signal. When you're out of time, I will give you a second signal. Be germane and, if possible, be brief. Avoid repeating points that have already been made. Above all, be courteous. It is possible to disagree without being disagreeable. Who may speak? Registered voters in Brookline and Hollis, members of the administration for presentations or to answer questions, and District Council Upton. Others may be may be allowed to speak if the majority of the members present vote, vote to allow it. Disruptive behavior or personal attacks are out of line, out of bounds, and out of order. To clarify, speaking without being recognized or failing to stop when your time has run out is disruptive behavior. The moderator is responsible for keeping the meeting on track and maintaining order. If things get out of hand, the moderator has various tools to work with. Well, that wasn't supposed to happen. There we go. The purpose of a point of order is to bring to the moderator's attention that the meeting rules are not being followed. If you raise a point of order, be clear about which rule or rules are not being followed. The motion can be used to appeal a ruling of the moderator. It cannot be used to ask a question or make a motion. Those can only be done when the voter has the floor. Amendments are the way that members can change an article that is being discussed. So that we all understand the change, please write down legibly your amendment when proposed and bring it to me. If the amendment is really short, you can skip that step. Amendments to dollar amounts should be made in final dollars, not amounts or percentages raised or lowers. Amendments to the operating budget only affect the bottom line unless the amendment is completely zeros out a line item. Collective bargaining agreements are not subject to amendment. It's basically an up or down vote. A motion to end debate may be made after waiting for your turn in line, or the motion may be made directly from the floor if no other speaker has the floor. It may not be made after the voter makes a speech, and I will not accept it if there has not been sufficient debate. For example, the first speaker after discussion is opened should not try to end debate. The motion is not debatable and requires a two-thirds vote to pass. In any case, all voters already in line may speak. The purpose of a motion to table is to pause consideration of an article during the discussion. It can only be made after the article is brought to the floor. The motion is not debatable and requires a simple majority to pass. A tabled article can be taken off the table later in the meeting by another simple majority vote. The motion can be restricted from re reconsideration, which means that the article cannot be brought up again within at least seven days later. A motion to reconsider, no, I skipped one. This is a new motion for this meeting. It, I call it suspend rules and postpone. I've had several requests for a motion like this for several years. This meeting has always had the ability to make it follow, following the rules, but this motion makes it explicit. The purpose of this motion is to stop discussion and voting on an article before it starts. It is a combination of a motion to suspend the rules and a motion to postpone indefinitely. As such, it effectively kills an article immediately. The motion is not debatable 
and requires a two-thirds majority to pass. It can be reconstruct, reconstruct, <coughs> restricted from consideration, but that's sort of useless because the motion cannot be reconsidered. A motion to reconsider is useful and appropriate if new information comes to light or spending approaches the 10% rule limit. It allows the voters to discuss a matter further and vote again. The motion can only be made by a person who voted on the prevailing side. A motion to restrict reconsideration does not block reconsideration. If passed, it requires that any subsequent reconsideration of the vote cannot occur for at least seven days. The motion can be applied to any previously completed and declared vote. The motion is not debatable and is, any, is, and is in order at any time. My copy of Robert's rule is an inch thick. It is simply not possible in a few minutes to take into account all of the possible motions and situations that can occur. The moderator has the responsibility for making rulings on such matters as things come up. However, this is your meeting. State law also gives voters at the meeting the ability to appeal and overrule any interpretation of the rules the moderator may make. If you disagree with a ruling, come to the microphone and raise a point of order, being clear what you are appealing. A second is required. The meeting then has the opportunity to vote on the ruling. If the ruling is a direct application of one of the meeting rules, you need to suspend or change the rules rather than make an appeal. These actions require a two-thirds vote. So shall the school district vote to adopt the rules for this meeting as proposed by the moderator? Is there a motion? Mo motion by Raoul Blanchet. Second by Darlene Mann. But on from here. I, I would Mi like to make a motion to amend the rules before they're adopted, sir. Mr. Garuba. At past meetings, I've witnessed parliamentary tactics used to prevent meeting attendees from getting the chance to speak to articles which they may have specifically attended the meeting to address. I very much dislike this tactic of shutting down speech to win a vote. So I offer this amendment to make sure that all of our residents get a chance to speak to their positions. With this in mind, I move to amend the rules presented by striking the motion to table from the list of non-debatable motions enumerated in Rule 30, and further to restrict its use by declaring that the motion to table is not in order until sufficient debate has occurred on the main motion. In addition, we shall not adopt the motion to suspend rules and postpone. Second. Second. Um, yep. Is there, do you wish to speak to your motion and can I have a copy of it? Mr. Garuba. Thank you, sir. It was not more than a few years ago that I witnessed a time when the motion to table was used to shut down discussion of SB2, even before a presentation or debate had taken place. In my opinion, the strength of our traditional meeting is that all voters hear the thoughts and feelings of their fellow residents. By allowing people to speak their mind, Issues are decided by informed voters, not by mailers or social media posts. If we are to preserve this direct democracy, we must strive to see that all sides of an issue are given fair opportunity to debate. This is the only way to ensure that the best argument wins. Even if you may think you've heard about a proposal in years past, each year new residents choose to participate in this process. I'm reminded of the quote of baseball great Joe DiMaggio. When asked why he hustled on plays that had little effect on the game's outcome, 
or on his team's standing, Joe replied, because there's always some kid who may be seeing me for the first time. I owe him my best. As Joe's sentiments imply, I believe we owe the participants of this meeting our best, not only to provide a just process, but also to show people who may be participating for the first time the best parts of our local democracy. This is our opportunity to help them learn to preserve this tradition that was carefully protected by generations before us. Free speech is not just a legal construct of our Constitution, but I believe we should practice it in our lives. It's important for us to listen to the concerns of our neighbors, even if we don't expect to agree. Please vote to support my amendment so that all residents who have come here with concerns and who may have prepared speeches are given the opportunity to be heard. To do otherwise will surely promote the end of our traditional town meeting format. Thank you. Is there dis further discussion on the rules? Mr. Solon. Tom Solon, Shady Rock Road, Brookline. I'm speaking in opposition to the amendment. Uh, there is a, a valid reason, and this is a important part of our democracy. One of the largest complaints that we have had about this particular meeting is the length of time that it takes. And one of the reasons it takes so long is we frequently get repetitive attempts to go against the will of the, the public by bringing things again year after year after year, even though they have been resoundingly defeated. This offers an option with a supermajority approval required to keep the meeting moving. And if the supermajority of this committee, of this legislative body, wants to move along and not enter into a, a discussion, especially ones that often have very lengthy voting requirements, I think they have the right to make that request. Thank you. Mr. Scales. Webb Scales, DuPont Gould Road, Brookline. Uh, not to be repetitive or anything, but if two-thirds of those present do not wish to hear the article presented, it is unlikely to prevail with a majority um, voting in favor. And so if two-thirds of us are willing to shut it down, then there is no purpose in moving it forward. Thank you. Yes, sir. Jim, Jim Gill, 30 Milton Place. Um, I is think it? you have the wrong voting card. What's Mine that? Is, I think you have the wrong voting card. Mine is white. Thank you. Before coming to the meeting, I was thinking to myself, I don't know if anybody in the auditorium can identify with this feeling with all the problems and pressures and divisions and negativity, I was thinking to myself, geez, I have to go to this uh, co-op meeting tonight. And I was filled with a certain amount of dread at the prospect of uh, coming to the meeting. And then about 30 seconds later, I started thinking about the 8 billion people on this planet. And I would estimate somewhere along the lines of 7.5 billion of them are told what to do from the moment they get up to the moment they put their head down, what they'll eat, what they won't eat, uh, every aspect of their life, because they don't live in a constitutional republic. And when I reflected on how fortunate I was to be in a country where a community can come together and debate things and listen to one another as a community, there's, there's no deep divisions here. Either we're talking about money or we're talking, there's nothing that should be, you know, at each other's throats, you know, winners and losers and that sort of thing. The basic point I'm trying to make is I went from feeling like I had to go to this meeting to the feeling very positive that I get to go to, to this meeting and express what I think and feel in the hopes of persuading other people, not browbeating them, not anything else, just persuading them 
So I love this format. I've only recently come and I feel very grateful for the opportunity to get to come and exercise my constitutional rights and I rise in support of Mr. Garuba's amendment. Yes, sir. Andy Raybeck, Sherwood Drive. Um, I'm not sure why that we would want to necessarily keep all the debate just to the people in attendance. Certainly there's a lot of people here, but Hollis and Brookline have, I don't know how many people, I know there's at least 8,000 in Hollis. I'm not sure how many of them are eligible voters, but they're not all represented here. There's a lot of people that can't be here. And so therefore, I think for, to make such decisions that affect every single taxpayer in our two towns, with just a relatively small percentage of the town represented here for one reason or another is not really very fair. And I don't know what people are afraid of to let these kind of issues go to a general town-wide election. So I think that's what we should really be trying to do. What are you afraid of? If you're right, it'll pass. <laughs> We're not here talking about SB2. We are talking about amendments to the rules. Yeah, well, that was, the, the context was with regard to one of the rules that said a two-thirds majority could shut down one of the amendments, and I'm sure that's one of the ones that appears to be, I'll say, controversial. Thank you. For the benefit of folks from Brookline, this is equivalent to your motion to pass over, which you already have in part of your rules. Ms. Roy. Hello, Carol Roy, South Merrimack Road, Hollis. I have a clarifying question. If this amendment were to pass, would that mean that none of these school board members could table a warrant article if needed? No, it simply requires, first of all, the, the table, motion to table becomes debatable rather than not debatable. And um, it requires sufficient debate which is my judgment call before you can make it, but it doesn't restrict who can make it. Thank you for clarifying. I think that we have provided sufficient debate any time a tabling has been asked for. I've seen you as moderator both in this meeting and in the Hollis Town meetings shut down an, a, a motion to table because we haven't heard sufficient debate. Same thing with ending debate on an article. So I do not stand in support of this amendment. Please vote no. All right, we are voting on an amendment to the rules. The amendment is several parts. Remove the motion to table from the list of non-debatable motions. In other words, make a motion to table debatable. Second, restrict its use by declaring the motion is not in order until sufficient debate. Third, to strike the, the motion to suspend and postpone. Do I have that right, Mr. Garuba? All right. This is an amendment to the rules. It requires a majority vote. If you are in favor of the amendment, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the amendment fails. We come back to the rules. I can't hear you. Not until after you're done with the rules. All right. Is there any further discussion of the rules? Seeing none, it's time to vote on the rules. If you are in favor of adopting the rules as proposed, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the ayes have it. No, it's not, and neither is my clicker. Ah, now my clicker is working. Hold on, it's not working yet. There you go, now 
Okay. Nancy Phillips, 12 Mendelssohn Drive, Hollis, New Hampshire. Um, parent of a 2014 graduate. Um, I would like to propose that we move Warren Article 9 to the beginning of the meeting for a vote. The motion is to move Article 9, which is SB2, to uh, the first article to be taken up. Um, I didn't quite catch your main name because I was fiddling with the clicker. Oh, Nancy Phillips, 12 Mendelssohn Drive. Which town? Hollis, New Hollis. Hampshire. Is there a second? Second, Ginny Brooks. Is there debate on moving Article 9 up forward? Seeing none, if you are in favor, this is simple majority vote. If you are in favor of moving Article 9 forward, which incidentally is a one hour ballot vote, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the ayes have it. However, I'm not quite ready to start articles. Just a, a quick summary of the warrant, followed by a presentation by the Budget Committee. Article 1 is the HESA contract, that's the support staff. Article two is the teacher's contract, Hollis Education Association. Article three is the, is the school operating budget. Article four is the SAU budget, which is also required as a ballot vote. Article five is the facilities maintenance trust fund. Article six is the contingency fund. Article seven is a petition article to rescind the ability to retain unassigned balance. Article 8 is an amendment to the Articles of Agreement between Hollis and Brookline. And Article 9 is to adopt um, SB2 as the form of government of this district. Ms. Mann. Good evening. I'd like to take just a few minutes to talk about some historical information and background, and give some background context to some of the items we'll be discussing this evening. The first is the 10% limitation. RSA dictates a maximum allowable um, budget that can be passed t at tonight's meeting. The um, starting point for that calculation is the recommended articles by the Budget Committee. And as a result of the um, 29 $0.7 million um, of recommended articles by the Budget Committee. The highest maximum allowable budget this evening would be $32.6 million. So the budget for the Hollis Brookline High School and Middle School has a pretty consistent distribution among the budget components. Over many years, we've seen that about 55% of the budget is directed towards salaries and benefits of staff. 20% to special education costs, 3% for each of the following, transportation, debt service, transfers among um, accounts, and building maintenance, with the remaining 13% for general education expenses. For the period from FY10 through um, the current budget, um, over that period we see um, cumulative inflation of about 39.5%. Over that period, the items of the budget that rise greater than that rate of inflation include health insurance rising at 98%, student services costs based on student needs at 108%, and New Hampshire retirement system contributions due to rate changes and changes in funding at the state level by 277%. Items running um, below the rate of inflation include salaries, 
and debt service, which is running at a negative 47%. Oh, by the way, salaries are at a level of 30%. Sorry. It's not as long as it looks. I'll be quick. So looking at student enrollment, between Hollis Brookline High School and Hollis Brookline Middle School, the enrollment is split approximately one-third to the middle school and two-thirds to the high school. The five years on the chart in red are estimates of um, enrollment, and we're looking at an enrollment increase of about 15 students into the next year, followed by a very slight decline before the enrollment starts rising. The five years after this chart would show increases to the district based on the K to six elementary increases of those students matriculating up to the co-op. Because the composition of the um, students is a significant part of the apportionment formula, it's important to look at who's sending whom to, to, to the district. So you see there in the middle of the chart, we had a few years of a relatively close 50-50 split of the student population. And it's slowly been moving and shifting to about 54-46 where we are today. So that's 54% of the student population from Hollis and 46% from Brookline. And that's looking to be relatively consistent for the next five years as it moves to say 55-45 Hollis Brookline. On a cost per pupil basis, this is a formula. Um, cost per pupil is calculated by the DOE. The same formula has been used for over 50 years. And the co-op consistently is below average um, compared to the state cost per pupil. For FY23, which is the end of the last school year, and it's the last year that cost per pupil has been calculated by the state, it's the most current year, uh, the co-op falls at 4% below the state average. From a comparative standpoint, um, you see in red the state average, in yellow the co-op cost per pupil, and then the costs associated with some um, communities in the area. Now we compare ourselves to these communities for a few different reasons. Sometimes it's proximity, like Nashua. Um, sometimes it's cooperative districts, like Exeter and Oyster River. Sometimes um, it's uh, test scores, possibly Sohegan. Um, and the important thing to note is that the co-op falls below uh, Exeter and Oyster River and Sohegan, which are um, the highest bars on the chart. Um, we're about equivalent to Milford and communities like Bedford and Nashua that have substantial tax bases and um, substantial businesses to contribute to those tax bases. Their costs per students fall below ours. Now I know there's a lot of information on this chart. This chart in yellow is 165 districts for the state of New Hampshire. It's ranked from lowest to highest. You'll see the blue line, um, which is the first one on the left, is the co-op. Um, the next line that's highlighted is the state average. The co-op falls in the bottom quarter of the ranked school districts. We're ranked 39th in the state, and that's the, the bottom quarter. When compared to other cooperative school districts on a K to 12 basis, so any cooperative district that isn't just middle school and high school, but it's any, all the grades K to 12, the co-op also falls in the bottom quarter. And when compared among the cooperative school districts that are middle and high schools, the co-op is the lowest in a cost per student basis. So the important thing to remember um, tonight is once a budget is approved, that approved budget is um, reduced by revenue and state aid by about 25% to determine tax effort. And it's that tax effort which is applied to determine the tax rate for each community. So um, what you see here is that we have had some years um, that that reduction is based on revenue and state aid, and we actually have had some years where, while the budget was increasing due to revenue and uh, state aid, we did see reductions in what the tax effort needed to be paid between the two districts. And the most recent um, combination of years on that chart 
is FY14, FY16, FY18, and FY21. In those years, the amount of tax effort actually went down from the previous year, which would have resulted in a decrease in the co-op tax rate on your bill. This next chart looks at revenue and state aid, trend, state aid trends. The lower lines in blue are the revenue trends, and you see that it, it, it for the most part, is a pretty consistent level. Um, you do see a year where that amount spikes, and that's due to um, higher amounts of the unreserved fund balance that gets returned to the taxpayer. And in the most recent year, that increase was due to um, significant underruns as a result of COVID and some programs and activities that weren't taking place in the school in addition to some a substantial return on um, student services costs. From a state aid perspective, the red lines, you do see a level of consistency there. So, th so state aid is determined predominantly by average daily membership, which is driven by enrollment. There are in any given year uh, seven to nine different elements of the, the um, aid formula. And that year where there's a spike where we were a little bit higher than the other years was because of um, a one-time legislative change to adequacy that brought back um, an old component of adequacy that in our case was directly attributable to Brookline because it was an, an, a piece of the adequacy formula that Hollis um, wasn't eligible for. But what you do see is that there's some consistency um, year over year uh, for that um, adequacy aid. As we move the, to the very last two columns, and I'm pointing over here because I don't want to keep turning around. Um, the last two lines on that chart, you'll see in blue a reduction to revenue, which is in the, in the area of about $265,000, and a very slight reduction in adequacy aid, which is estimated to be really just about $7,000. There were some significant changes to the adequacy formula, but as a result of some retiring aid, and um, just the distribution of students, it's netting to a, a pretty equivalent level, level of adequacy as we look toward FY25. I mentioned earlier the apportionment formula. The apportionment formula is what we use to uh, distribute costs to Hollis and Brookline. So we take the total, we remove revenue, we remove, uh, apply the apportionment formula, apply each district's state aid, to come up with a tax effort for each community. That apportionment formula, as I mentioned, is driven significantly by average daily membership. There is an equalized value component as well. And where we start the um, formula with about that 54-46 split in students, we end up with a uh, distribution of the local tax effort to be 56% Hollis and 44% and Brookline. To make it a little bit easier, of the um, $23.6 million that ends up being allocated, uh, 13 .2, about $13.2 million would go to Hollis and about ten point four to Brookline. I know a lot of people don't like to look at a lot of numbers charts, but this one is just important. It lays out exactly where we start and where we're estimated to finish, and it really just puts all the you know, numbers to the dollar of how um, the apportionment formula works. So as I mentioned, we start with the 30.9 million. We reduce about $1.9 million in revenue. At this point, the net to be apportioned, the third line is what gets split between the two districts. Each district's amount is then reduced by their um, adequacy aid and retained um, statewide education property tax, property grant, and uh, you, which results in local tax effort. That is then applied against the tax base to determine a tax rate. And so what we're looking at for the co-op is a tax rate of $5.65 per thousand versus the Brookline tax rate of $8.93 per thousand. Uh, this chart's a little bit cleaner um, to see. It highlighted yellow are the numbers I just um, mentioned, which would be an 11% increase on the co-op portion of your um, tax bill, which is 11% and 12.7% for Brookline. 
The other components and the taxes that are listed were um, in bold for the K-6 local or elementary schools. Um, that was approved already at the Hollis District meeting and by the ballot um, vote at, in Brookline because the Brookline School District is SB2. And um, the town rates were determined as a result of town meetings in both communities. So as a result, once you combine all of the tax elements, Hollis would be looking at an increase of about 7% to $17.83, and Brookline, an increase of 8.6% or $22.57. Thank you. I've gone way beyond the end. Darlene, have I gone way beyond the end? Yes. I don't know where I am. All right, Article 9. Yes, ma'am. Uh, moderator, I would like to move to suspend and postpone indefinitely petition warrant Article Number 9. Motion to post suspend and postpone Article 9. Moved by, ma'am, your name? Your name. Judy Cook, Brookline, 10 Main Street. Seconded by um, Mr. Harris. Motion to... Suspend and postpone indefinitely. Yes, postpone indefinitely. Yes, Mr. Garuba. This is not a debatable motion. This is not a debatable motion. No. However, I am not certain this is a brand new motion. I haven't seen it in the book. I don't know if it's a privileged motion that can be made out uh, without waiting in line. So since this is a brand new motion, I would like that clarified. People who speak at my pleasure, I get to recognize who I choose. So I chose to recognize Ms. Cook. Over the other folks in line? Yes. Thank you. All right, this is not a debatable motion. It requires a two-thirds vote. If this motion passes, then the article is dead. It cannot be brought up again in this meeting. If you are in favor of suspending and postponing Article 9, please raise your cards. Drew, another point Thank of you. order. It's not, it's a three-fifths vote, not a two-thirds vote. I disagree. Read the law. I'm not voting on Article 9. I am voting on the motion to postpone and suspend, which, as we discussed earlier, is a two-thirds vote. Thank you. All opposed? It's because it's two-thirds, it's close enough that I want to count it. So I want to get counters ready.
argue about who, who I get to choose. But you're right on the two-thirds. On what? You're the right, right on the two-thirds. Oh, yeah. And I'm also right on the two-thirds. Are you ready to count? All right, all in favor of the motion to suspend and postpone Article 9, please raise your cards. Who get the people in the back of the room? Okay, all right. All right, you can put your cards down now. All opposed to motion to postpone and suspend. Please raise your cards. Okay, I think you can put your cards down now. Mr. Corey, I would love to know how a basketball got up there. On the motion to suspend and postpone, yes was 275, no was 240. The motion fails. Can we have the slides for Article 9, please?
Ms. Power. Thank you, Mr. Moderator and members of the Hollis Brookline Cooperative Com Community. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you relative to Article 9, the adoption of official ballot voting. For the record, I am, I am Diane Power from Brookline. Slide. To begin, SB2 is an alternative form of meeting to the traditional meeting. At a traditional meeting like here tonight, Warren articles are debated, de deliberated, amended, and then voted upon immediately. Under SB2, the meeting is separated into two parts or sessions. The first session is the deliberative session, and that's, tip that's held in early February. And the second session is the ballot voting session held the second Tuesday in March during town elections and voting occurs all day at the polls or by absentee ballot. Slide. Thank you. The deliberative session follows the exact same format as the traditional meeting except no final votes are cast on warrant articles. Voters in the school district attend the meeting. At the first session, Warren articles are brought to the floor for debate and possible amendment. All warrant articles are finalized by the meeting to be printed on the official ballot for the second session. Notably, the main difference between the traditional meeting and SB2 is as follows. As I said, final voting is not done at the deliber deliberative session, but at the balloting session at the polls on town election day. Importantly, no tabling of articles is permitted. Every article is considered by the body at the first session. Also, there is a provision for a default budget in the event that the operating budget article is not passed by the voters at the polls. Slide. Balloting session, the second session. Each Warren article, having been finalized at the first session, appears on the official ballot in the form of a question. Voters indicate their approval or disapproval by a yes or no vote. The balloting session is held at least 30 days after the deliberative session. Importantly, this affords the voters both the time and the opportunity to do research, ask questions, and attend information se sessions. In order to be able to make an informed decision before casting their votes on each article. This eliminates the need to have to make a very quick decision on an article and then vote right then and there on the spot, which unfortunately all too often happens at a traditional meeting. The, battling, the balloting session affords all day voting at the polls in each town, Hollis and Brookline, or by absentee ballot. The reality is that there are many um, groups of people who simply are unable to attend a traditional meeting, such as the, the elderly, disabled individuals, couples with childcare needs, people who travel for business, college students who are out of town at school, snowbirds, military members who are serving uh, out of state or out of country, and as well as night and weekend sh employees. As a result, these people, um, their voices are not able to be heard. Slide. So this slide essentially it summar summarizes a data analysis of voter participation with um, traditional meeting as compared to SB2. The main takeaway is that in our Brookline School District, which has the SB2 form of meeting, we found that 13 more, uh, th there's 13 times more voter participation in the overall decision making in the, in the, in the district under the SB2 process than it is uh, realized under the traditional form of meeting. And undoubtedly, this is both very positive as well as exciting. Slide. To summarize, the SB2 format decouples the traditional meeting providing for a deliberative session and a balloting session. Importantly, SB2 will serve to eliminate the biggest problem with a traditional meeting, and that is voter disenfranchisement. Notably, statistics show higher voter participation under SB2, 
And I am confident that we all can agree that when more people are able to participate in the decision-making process and have their voices heard, this provides a better representation of the will of the people in our cooperative school district. I greatly appreciate your time and your attention, and I respectfully ask that you carefully consider these points regarding the adoption of the official ballot voting under Article 9. That concludes my presentation, Mr. Moderator, and next I would like to introduce our next speaker, Mr. Bill Hebden. Slide. Mr. Hebden is a disabled Korean War veteran having honorably served our great country in the United States Marine Corps. He is a resident of Hollis and is the lead sponsor of Article 9 to adopt SB2. Unfortunately, due to Mr. Hebden's disability, he cannot an attend meetings of this sort, and therefore he is unable to participate in the decision-making process under this traditional meeting format. Thus, Mr. Hebden has been allowed to speak to Article 9 by way of vid video. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Could you play the video, please? Hello, Hollis and Brookline voters. My name is Bill Hebden. I built this home that I'm living in in 1973. <clears throat> I'm a Marine Corps veteran of the Korean War and someone who truly loves this town and wants to remain here until I'm gone. I have some concerns because being unable to attend meetings causing me to, is causing me to sponsor the 2024 Hollis Brookline Co-op Warrant Article 9, prompting the conversion of Warrant Article voting for the Co-op High School from a town meeting format to an SB2 ballot format. The ongoing inability of me and others like me to participate because of physical conditions means that we are unable to make our voices heard. And as you can see, I'm wheelchair bound. In addition, my medication is impossible, makes it impossible for me to attend any protracted town meetings where significant financial matters are voted on. I am on a fixed income and my voice in these matters for the co-op is silenced by our current town meeting format and those like me need to have our voices heard. In 2023, at a co-op meeting, an attendee estimated the attendance was 350 voters, or approximately 5% of the eligible voters of the combined Hollis Brookline towns. As I think most of you would agree, 5% is not a significant quorum in matters that are driving up our taxes for those of us on fixed income, as well as the remainder of the voters. It is not just a disa disabled who are disenfranchised by the town meeting format. There are also deployed military people, families with children, healthcare workers, those working second or third shift, and of course the snowbirds. So this is not really a partisan issue. All who live in these two towns need to have our voices heard. The town meeting format excludes many of us from this opportunity, and we really need to consider making this change. Okay. <clears throat> Ms. Brooks. Okay, I'm Virginia Brooks, 12 Mendelssohn Drive. And as you all saw, uh, when you switched from uh, the, you said you were not going to do Article 9 right away. You were going to, I, I can't remember what, 
my daughter, Nancy Phillips, was here in a wheelchair to, uh, to do Article 9. She had to leave because uh, and she has muscular dystrophy and we have health care workers in our home to help take care of her and she cannot stay because we, because we have health care workers so there's a time limit and my husband and I are both elderly and so that's what has to happen. We've lived here 27 years and uh, we have children and grandchildren who've gone to school in the Hollis Brookline schools and we want to be active and vote and we want to make sure that we can vote so that we want to have the best teachers and we want them to have the best salaries and it's important that we vote and take care of that and we also want to have the best football field and soccer fields and because we want the children to be active in sports and if you uh, if we don't have SB2 and we cannot vote and we cannot do those things, uh, then we can't participate in that. And we can't be here at 11 o'clock at night. But if we can come to the town meeting and we can vote uh, on a month later at the, where it's school or at the Lawrence Barn or wherever it's held, then that's a good thing. So therefore, I think we should have SB2. That's what we want. So, um, Mr. Pencaser. Yes, sir. My name is Aaron Pencasek. I am at 133 Dow Road in Hollis. Uh, I support this activity. I support this article. And the reason is not political. The reason is that we need to have every citizen in, in town have an opportunity to have their voices heard. Whatever the outcomes are, in terms of the decisions made on the warrant articles, that's fine, but let's all be able to vote on them and let's all be able to have our voices heard. Thank you. Yes, sir. Good evening, Mark Andrews, 35 West Hill, Brookline. I'm really happy that we brought this up to the front. As a community tonight, we all came together and said, yes, this is an important topic, and yes, we want to talk about it. I also understand your frustration. Every year, we talk about this important topic, and every year it gets shot down. I would argue one of the main reasons why that is, the people who stand to gain the most are not here tonight. We are. We have a good turnout tonight, but I also see some empty seats. Capacity in this room is 1485. We're nowhere close. In Brookline, we do have SB2, at least for our school, school district. On Tuesday, 844 people showed up. That's more than twice the total capacity for CSDA, 380, or 392. So what would we have done if all 844 people showed up to vote on Tuesday? Would we have turned them away? No, that's why we have SB2, to give everyone an opportunity to have a voice. And so we talked about the deliberative session. That is our opportunity to educate ourselves about the, the warrants, to educate ourselves about the topics, and also about a way to make amendments to it. So when we vote tonight, don't just vote for yourselves, Vote for the people who can't be here, like my friend Bill, or my other friend Bob, a World War II vet, both of which fought for their ability, our ability, to vote. And they also contributed to our community right up until the point when they couldn't, both of which are watching right now. They can't vote tonight. I've been here seven years. I've only missed one vote, and that vote was back in 2020 when I was in Afghanistan. I'm not getting any younger. I want to make this my forever home. I'd like to think that if I'm ever in a position where I can't leave, that my voice is still going to be heard. Thank you. Mr. Garuba. Joe Garuba, uh, Hollis Selectman, speaking on my own behalf. I believe I may have unique insight into the question of SB2. As many of you know, 
I'm the founder of Hollis Watch, an organization dedicated to preserving Hollis's rural character. Each year, we promote zoning amendments. These zoning amendments are decided on the ballot, similar to the manner that SB2 proposes deciding warrant articles. I have also promoted the passage of warrant articles at traditional town meeting. Having participated successfully in both systems, I can offer what I have learned. For the traditional town meeting, I was able to make a fact-based presentation that was vetted by all of the meeting attendees. I was able to make assertions and have them challenged by any attendee. A debate was conducted in public for all voters to see. Speakers were identified by name and kept their arguments focused and fact-based, considering their comments were witnessed by all attendees. The debate ended with all voters having been exposed to the best arguments of each side. And the issue was determined based on which side presented the best choice for Hollis. Zoning amendments, on the other hand, are voted on on election day along with the candidates. This is similar to the proposed SB2 process. The means for influencing votes in this system rely on a campaign of social media posts and mailers. Information presented in those venues is limited to a few bullet points. Unfortunately, political material of this nature is often targeted to a specific political party or group. For example, mailers may be sent to Republicans or Democrats only. SB2 will leave voters to make decisions with partial or biased information that does not get challenged. Finish up, Joe. So, in conclusion, the best decisions are made here at traditional town meeting where issues are debated, amended, and decided by caring, informed citizens. I ask you please to vote no on this article. Yes, sir. Andy Rabeck, Sherwood Drive, Hollis. I, I do support the SB2 article, but I, I am interested in hearing more about the opposition to it as well. I notice the board does not recommend this article. Um, seems to be unanimous. There's a lot of people here that seem to feel strongly. What I don't understand, though, is there's pros and cons, you know, as other people just spoke up and talked about some of the maybe the disadvantages or maybe why it's not no system is perfect but still concerns me that when we're looking at spending 30 plus million dollars which is I don't know the percentages but I got to bet that's probably a huge part of our town budget that goes toward you know the big chunk of what we pay our taxes for and I think that for something like that if we we're talking about you know a hundred dollars or something I wouldn't probably worry about it but something like this I think that every voter, in, el eligible voter in town should have an opportunity to vote on this. We have a deliberative session that people can go to and maybe we just need to find better ways to provide education, provide the pros and the cons. But by and large, I think having a very small group, of, relatively small group of people um, is not representative of the town and yet the town ends up carrying, you know, footing the bill for everything here. So that's why I support SB2. Thank you. Wait, I, I need to uh, correct a defect in what, well, what's happened so far, which is I never read the article and it never got moved and seconded. <laughs> <clears throat> I apologize for the fault, but we got shuffled around with this, that, and the other thing. Article 9, shall we adopt the provisions of RSA 40 colon 13, known as SB 2, to allow official ballot voting on all issues before the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District on the second Tuesday of March. A 60% majority vote is required. The school board does not recommend this article by a vote of six to zero. This article will require a, a ballot vote and the polls will may remain open for an hour. It's moved by Diane Power, seconded by Sue Homo. All right, Mr. Constantian. <clears throat> Mark Constantian, Swiss Lane. I'm no Bill Hebden, but I do 
rise to support this motion. I was a plastic surgeon in Nashua for 43 years. I've lived in Hollis for 42 years. All our children went to the Hollis public schools all the way through. I made town meetings reliably, but I virtually never made school meetings. The reason it was my shifts. I worked day shift, often second shift, frequently third shift. I got up at 4.45 to go to the uh, office and then the operating room, frequently worked till 8 o'clock at night. And because I did the majority of the hand and facial reconstructions here for decades, I um, uh, could not subject my patients to, I uh, really went back at night. And, and I couldn't come to the meetings because I couldn't have my patients uh, being operated on a surgeon who'd had five hours of sleep. We are all worried about disenfranchisement of particular ethnic groups, but the current system disenfranchises everybody, almost everybody in Hollis. That's not the way we do it in New Hampshire. Everyone should be enfranchised, and that's why I support this motion. Mr. Belanger. Jim Belanger, Plain Road, Hollis. My girlfriend had a family gathering, and I knelt down on one knee and asked her to marry me. She and her family said no. I did this several years in a row, and they kept saying no. Her name was Sandy Baker II, nicknamed SB2. I guess I should <laughs> stop asking. What happens when we adopt SB2? We have a loss of resident interest and poor attendance at the deliberative session. Mount Vernon had one person at the deliberative session one year. Data from towns that have SB2 show a marked reduction in meeting attendance. In many cases, the small number of attendees means the quality of the debate is poor and uninformative. People who are interested in controlling their town budget but did not attend the deliberative session find that when they go to vote, there are two choices. Either vote for the proposed budget that was decided by a few or a default budget that might even be higher. With little or no knowledge of what took place at the deliberative session, people have little idea of what was behind the decisions made at the deliberative session and can't ask questions. Special interest groups can overwhelm town budgets to get their way. Due to low attendance at the deliberative session, small groups can gather and get articles passed that normally would not have seen the light of day, but they end up on the ballot on voting day. Folks, we are in New England, and the traditional town meeting is the New England way. Most of us chose New England because of that way of life. Let's not change it now. Finally, I respect the folks who like and want SB2, but most of us don't, and I would hope that message gets heard loud and clear. Let's vote no again, please. Yes, sir. Thank you, Will Walker, Milton Place in Hollis. I have worked with people with disabilities for 30 years. I have worked with veterans with disabilities. I have advocated for people with disabilities for 30 years. I do not support SB2, and I want to bring three points why. This is the notion of being disenfranchised. Being disenfranchised is being deprived of full participation in society, especially the opportunity to make one's voice heard. This is full participation. Neither our town, uh, traditional town meeting format or SB2 provide full participation for people who cannot attend the meetings. Okay, they are disenfranchised. My second point is this real-world paradox of SB2 actually increasing disenfranchisement, even though it separates voting from the deliberative session. While the spirit and intent of SB2 is for balanced participation from a significant portion of the town, the reality is that the low attendance of deliberative sessions allows them to fall victim to special interest groups that subvert the spirit and intent of SB2. In other words, the special inter interest groups become the puppet masters and the voting public becomes the audience who can only clap or boo. It, furthermore, in the 29 years it's been around, SB2 has been modified numerous times, and we've only seen an uptake of SB2 in about one-third of the towns in New Hampshire. 
This high rate of change and low uptake speaks for itself. SB2 is flawed legislation. My third and final point is this. I strongly advocate for full participation in society by everyone and for the opportunity for everyone to make their voice heard. If that's what we want, and I think that's what we all want, we should spend our energy leading New Hampshire to truly address disenfranchisement rather than debating the adoption of flawed legislation. Thank you. Ms. Brown. Elizabeth Brown, Williams White Hollis. I'd like to move to end debate and call the question. This is a motion to end debate. Moved by Mr. Ms. Brown, seconded by Mr. Harris. This motion requires a two-thirds vote. If it passes, uh, the gentleman in the blue sweater, are you in the line? All right, and I believe Mr. Garuba has already spoken, so he'll speak afterwards. Is there anybody in line, uh, already in line, who has also already spoken? I don't see any, all right. So, if you are in favor of ending debate, which allows everybody still already in line to speak, please raise your cards. <laughs> Thank you. If you are opposed, raise your cards. Looks to me like the eyes have it. <coughs> Ms. McGee. Yes, Cat McGee, um, Becky's place. Uh, I'd like to um, speak about something that would hopefully add to the discussion but not be repetitive of what's already been said. And that comes back to sort of our form of government and why we keep debating SB2. Um, whereas I uh, was a representative for a flotarial of four towns, I had two SB2 towns in the past. I've gotten up at the microphone in the past to talk about what those deliberative sessions were like. But what I'd like to say is that it seems to me that the issue that people have in bringing this back again and again is that they want to try and have more of an influence on being able to get at the budgets that get to be voted on uh, each year. And what I want to explain to folks, especially about property taxes and the school costs, um, we elect people to serve on our budget committees and our school boards in order to do the work of bringing us the budgets. So that work is done by them. And in a deliberative session, um, those budgets can be upended by people who really don't have any understanding of what the school's needs are or how the budgets work. So we already have representative government that's providing that information here. If we're dissatisfied with how much of the school budgets are coming out of our property taxes, then we have to look at the state budgets because it's the lack of state funding that puts the amount of taxes that we pay from our property taxes towards the school to be as high of a percentage as it is. And we hardly ever mention that at these meetings. So what I've said in the past is when I first started coming to the school meetings, I noticed that we were pitting the taxpayers against the schools. I think that's something that has to be fixed, but it is not fixed by SB2. Thank you. Yes, sir. Rob Rushton, uh, Flint Meadow Drive in Brookline. Um, I'm sure a number of people that are in this meeting tonight also attended the SB2 deliberative session in Brookline. And if you were like me in any way, you know that meeting was, in, in my words, a nightmare. Uh, we had to basically guess what we thought would be palatable to the voters at large in the community when the actual voting took place. That's a very difficult job. What we have in this meeting is the ability to amend, and by the amendments that are taken here, we get a very good sense of whether or not things like our budgets will pass or not. Uh, I think we lose an awful lot, and uh, I think one additional point is that uh, other speakers have talked about special interests. 
Uh, of the 80 to 90 people who were in the Brookline deliberative session, uh, I'm sure a good number of those had various agendas. And uh, consider whether or not you want somebody like me deciding what you actually see on the ballots when you go vote on Tuesday. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi. I'm Carla Ramirez on North Pepperell Road. I just, I want every resident of Hollis to be able to vote. Our elders, many of whom have lived here for decades, want to vote. Our military, currently serving this country, should be able to vote. Many of them have kids in this school. And most importantly, parents of infants who will be in this school someday should not have to make the decision as to who can come and vote and who has to stay home with the kids or the baby to get them to bed. Both parents should be able to vote. These meetings, and they should be able to vote on every article, these meetings have ran way past 10 o'clock at night. This, is, this should not be a partisan issue in any way. Please stop disenfranchising the voters. And disenfranchising, I mean by them not being able to vote and participate. Isn't that what everybody wants, is that everybody's voice is heard? Please pass Article 9, SB 2, and thank you for your time. Yes, ma'am. Hello, uh, Chelsea Lenartz, 50 Pine Hill Road. Uh, we moved to Hollis about five years ago. I have a two and a half year old daughter and a nine month old baby at home with my husband. He is the one who's really having a tough time right now. Um, the reason I want to speak is I, we've heard from veterans, we've heard from people with disabilities, but I want to represent the new moms, new parents contingent. SB2 would allow my husband to be here and exercise his right to vote, which he would love to do, but it just would be an absolute nightmare. We tried it at the town meeting, if you saw us, my kids are really cute, they were running haywire. Um, but it's bedtime and it's just not feasible for us. Um, I want him to be here so he can vote on the schools because our daughters are gonna attend the schools here one day and I want the teachers to be paid well. I want the schools to be the great schools we moved to town for. Um, so that's why I'm going to vote for SB2, so that everyone has an opportunity to vote. And the other reason is, three months ago, my daughter would have been six months, I nursed my child, so I wouldn't have been able to come here, it would have been him. I think women have been sidelined enough in history that we shouldn't have to make these decisions. Thank you. Mr. S <coughs> Mr. Scales, I assume you have, you have a voting card. I do. Thank you. Webb Scales, DuPont Gould Road, Brookline. Uh, if what you want is for everybody to get to vote, then yes, by all means, please vote for SB2. However, when you show up at the polls, if you actually want to have a choice, if you want to have something significant to vote on, please vote against SB2. If you want a perfect example of SB2, look at your warrant right in front of you at Article 4. That's the SAU budget. This is conducted under an SB2-like system. And if you look at your choices there, you've got a choice between $1.1 million or $1.1 million. I mean, if you want to round it up, it's $1.2 million. But the point is that you have your choice. You can either vote for one number or for another number that's almost identical to it. So don't you feel enfranchised? Don't you feel empowered by this system that we have? This meeting, unlike SB2, is a negotiation process. We get to make a proposal. If people don't like it, we get to amend it. If we still don't like it, we can amend it again. And little known fact, if we vote something down at this meeting, we can bring it back up again with a third number if we want. We did this at the Brookline meeting just last week. Um, we, we have an article to put money away for the fire department to buy fire trucks. and. Somebody voted to uh, amend, to raise it to $100,000, and the meeting said, no, $100,000 is way too much, done. But we brought it back up again for $50,000, and we all said, oh, well, $50,000, yeah, we can, we can swallow that. So under SB2, we would have set it at $100,000, it would have gone to the polls, the polls would have said no, we would have put away nothing for the fire department for that year. This meeting is a huge improvement over SB2. SB2 is not the solution to our difficulties here. Please vote against this 
uh, article. Thank you. Ms. Hicks. Hi, uh, 8 Maple Knoll Drive. Um, I have a, a question, but with that, my first comment is that when you look this up online, it, there's a lot in there about that the, the voting might go up, but the involvement goes down. Um, like someone else had said in an old article, it said that in Milford, New Hampshire, only 1% showed up for the deliberative session. In uh, Hudson, less than 0%. And in Amherst, uh, 2%. So it's far less people that are actually involved in the process. Um, and when you do look it up online, there's a, only a couple of pros, but the cons specifically go through loss of resident interest and poor attendance at deliberative sessions, loss of control over your town budget, long drawn out process and uninformed voters, additional costs when SB2 is voted, I guess because of voting machines. But it goes on to say about special interest groups and that some of these issues, special interest groups will spend the most money to get resident votes. But then it also goes on to say that a town does not need to have SB2 to put on the Warren article for an official ballot. And my question is, is, is this our only choice to have a traditional meeting, SB2, or can we have a charter system that's, that is a charter system available to school districts where we could actually change our charter and tailor it and have the best of both worlds, like maybe open up some of these bigger issues that we do have voting during the day? instead of going all the way to SB2, do something that actually works for our towns? There is a th another form of town government, you put your finger on it, a charter. Now, I'm not an expert on a charter, but it does allow for completely different ways of voter participation. It's a big effort to get that through, and you would need to start a conversation with the school board and the administration, but it can be done. So I would very much like to encourage people to vote no on this and that possibly that process does start because we really could come up with a process that would be the best for our town. Yes, sir. Hi, Brian Loughlin, Toddy Brook Road. And um, a lot of people mentioned that they can't come out to the town meeting, but they wouldn't be able to come out to the deliberative session either, which is where most of the um, decisions are made. Because on the ballot, as Mr. Scale said, the vote might be, um, yes, you might be given the option to vote, but you, the differences are gonna be small. And also, a lot of times, people may not have the understanding and the comment that has happened in the town meeting. Another thing is, people have mentioned how not bad a law the SB2 is, but if you sign up for it, you're subject to any future changes. So it may be that it gets even worse, but you're, it's too bad for you because you're stuck in SB2, and as uh, towns that have gone to SB2 have found, it's very hard to leave. Thank you. I... Yes, ma'am. Gail Ch sorry, sorry. <laughs> Gail Chaddick, uh, 26 Russell Hill Road in Brookline. Uh, I think it's safe to say that everything has been said. Undaunted, I want to push on and <laughs> say one other thing. I uh, oppose this article, but I voted for the debate to go forward, and those are not inconsistent positions. I think what is important about the existing system is we get to see each other and see how neighbors think about something, and we also get to ask questions of all those people sitting right there who put enormous amounts of time into town service and no one comes to their meetings. How do I know this? I started going to some of their meetings. And one of the things I learned at the uh, deliberative session in Brookline was that no one, no, there was no public input whatsoever all year to the budget for the Brookline schools under SB2, and it's because no one came. And they said, we really want to hear what people think. We want to know what they're concerned about. So here's what I want to contribute. We are in a post-COVID era. All of us know what remote uh, meetings are like. Now, I'm sure there are at least 50 reasons why we can't do this or why it would be hard to do it. Nonetheless, really, there are ways to participate in meetings now that didn't exist before. And I'm sure there are safeguards to do it too. We need a newspaper in town and a good one, the Rotary, the Hollis 
Brookline Rotary is doing a lot of that work. We need more of it. If you really want democracy, local democracy, remember that this is one day of the year. There are 364 other days of the year, and a lot of people are working, uh, putting in long hours and yearning to hear the public say a single word. So my suggestion is vote this down, but use the other 600 and 364 days to solve the problem of access. It's not rocket science, it can be done, other people have done it. If you're in churches, you already know how it's being done. And use the 364 days to talk to these people. It's been brought to my attention that some folks are trying to use this as a voting card. This is, this is not a voting card. <laughs> this is a voting card. <laughs> Ms. St. John. Michelle St. John, Orchard Drive, Hollis. Um, I am opposed to this article, um, and I don't want to be repetitive, so I just want to ha have to step a couple of points. Um, in, you know, there was some really compelling um, speakers this evening that talked about their right to vote, and I appreciate them and the service they gave to our country or where they are in their individual life's journey that might prevent them from coming to a meeting such as this. However, I think um, a big component that is being glossed over is there is still a very critical deliberative session that has to be, a per we need participation. So um, just what exactly would you be voting on on election day? We elect a board and a budget and we hire highly qualified and respected school administration um, for this very reason. They spend a full year thinking about, working on, iteration after iteration after iteration of a budget. I've served on the Hollis School Board. I've participated in this process. It is valuable. And um, I will echo that we have ample opportunity every month to provide input on that budget. Um, so if a deliberative session is poorly attended or a well-organized group commandeers the meeting for their own purposes, that is what we are voting for. So all that work that the people that we elect, the administration that we hire is for nothing. They get a choice to vote, which was not the intention of the original warrant. So I just would like the audience tonight to think about what it is exactly that you were voting on. The work of these individuals or the work of a small group that doesn't want to support X, Y, or Z. Thank you. Ms. Levesque. Good evening. Melanie Levesque, Brookline, McDaniels Dock Drive. First of all, I want to thank the school board and thank the Budget Committee, as well as our administration. Many people, yes, thank you very much. You hear many people talk about why they moved to Brookline and Hollis, and it's because of our great schools. As a matter of fact, the Hollis Brookline High School is number six out of all of the New Hampshire high schools. And those folks that I just mentioned are largely responsible for that. I will also say I've had in my mind that just because I elect a great school board doesn't mean that the outcomes are going to be good. And that is largely because of the, the deliberative session. Brookline has SB2 at our Brookline Elementary Schools. And a couple weeks ago we had a Brookline deliberative session. Some of the th items, the Warren articles that were voted on were one, to 
proposed to get rid of SEL. If anybody knows what that means, it's social emotional learning, and that's something that many of our children need to get through bullying, um, anxiety, hate speech. Also, to stop paying dues to lobbyists. The lobbyists were the New Hampshire School Board Association, a resource that we need, and to study breaking up the co-op, which is very important to us. So had people not attended that deliberative session, all of those items would have gone on the ballot. So I am very much in favor of people having the right to vote, but I think that we have folks that want to sway our vote, who give the wrong impression that will then be on the ballot. So I ask you to please vote no on SB2. Mr. Buto. Brandon Buto, Buttonwood Drive, Hollis. I'm not going to move the question since that's already been done, but um, I do have a couple of things to say on this. Uh, I've heard some really good, strong arguments on both sides of this issue tonight. Uh, some of the best discussion I've ever heard on it, actually. Uh, and I'd like to commend both sides of this argument for being respectful of each other. Um, I think it's been very healthy for us to have this discussion. Having said that, uh, I come down on the side of opposing this article, and the reason is that without this meeting to have these kinds of discussions, we lose our ability to function as an integrated community. This is our opportunity to come together and listen to each other, understand each other's concerns and fears and hopes. And if we don't have this place in which to make these decisions in an informed way, then we effectively lose our ability to function as a community all together. So I hope that you vote this down. Thank you. As I recall, Mr. Walker, is that right? Me? Yes. No. I'm all right, I apologize. I don't, I don't. I can't <clears throat> know all 800 folks here, so. Excuse me, <clears throat> I've got a frog in my throat. Uh, I'll try to add a couple of new things to, Your the, name, uh, please, sir. to the discussion here. My name is Dennis Beaches. Uh. I'm in Brookline. Um, some of these things are questions. One question to you, sir, is, is not this meeting being videoed and recorded? It is being videoed, and the video will be, it's live streamed now. It will be available on the SAU 41 website. Okay, then I put forth that there's a lot more people, in fact, potentially, potentially a factor of at least 10, given what was seen in Brookline with the SB2 and the number of votes uh, that were cast on, on election day on issues related to our schools there. I put forth that there are a lot more people listening to this meeting right now than we're taking account for. They're looking at us. They're looking at each one of us out there. Speak into the mic, please, because we can't hear you otherwise. I certainly will speak into the mic. So when you watch a TV show, I hope that you're watching, you're watching it to be educated, to be informed, to think about things, have your own perspective. You're free then to talk to your neighbors, to the representatives of your town. The debate doesn't stop after the deliberative session for those people out there who are watching us now. And they can watch us re-recorded also, watch us over and over again, hear these same arguments. It's terrible that at least we, 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 we're talking about 5% making the decisions for the 100% of the town. Now, if there's a better way, a better system of government to get those people to then cast their ballots 
and listen into this session and even phone in their comments, zoom in their comments, that would be good. But yes, it takes time. I have a second question. Is it possible that we can adopt charters for school districts or is that only for town? Yes, I believe you, you can. have a, a lawyer. Yes, you on can. The panel? Yes. Okay, that's interesting. Anyways, my main point is has been made. There are a lot more people out there who are already participating in the deliberative session. Yes, they can't speak to you. You can't see their faces. But they're out there. You watch these channels on TV. What are we doing? We're depriving these people of now casting their vote. And you've heard from the surgeon of his inability to be here. There are other people. I know a lady who's expecting her third child soon. She can't be here. Finish up, please. I'm finished. Thank you. Mr. Garuba, do you wish to speak or you had enough? I do not. I think uh, everyone else has done a great job. Thank you. All right. All discussion? No. no point, it... point of order? Yes. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, my understanding is that we'll be voting by ballot, and I don't recall having proper instruction as to the correct way to fill out um, the ballot. Could you review that? Thank you. Yes. We are voting by ballot. There are ballot boxes in that corner and in that corner, and you should already have received a ballot card that looks like this. It's yes or no, fill in the circle for the ballot that you like. This is a one hour vote. It is now 8.20, so I will keep the, the polls open until at least 9.20. Um, we will reconvene for further business after a few minutes after everyone here has had the chance to vote. The polls are now open.
If people will take their seats, we can resume. All right, it's time to move on. Ms. Roy. Yes, Mr. Moderator, thank you. Carol Roy, South Merrimack Road, Hollis. I'd like to move that we hear Article 2, the teacher's contract, next. Motion is to take up Article 2 next, which will put it before Article 1. Seconded by, may I, uh, tell me your name again. Becky Balfour. Becky Balfour. This is a simple majority vote to take up Article 2 before Article 1. If you are, inter if you are in favor of taking up Article 2 now, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the ayes have it. Becky. I would like to remind folks that article, uh, that the ballot boxes are still open for Article 9 and will remain so till they are open for a total of at least an hour. Um, <coughs> so, Article 2. It's a collective bargaining agreement with the Hollis Education Association. Thank you. <laughs> No, there you go. To see if the school district will vote to approve the cost items for the first year of a three-year collective bargaining agreement reached between the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School, school Board and the Hollis Education Association for the 2024-25, 2025-26, and 2026-27 school years, which calls for the following increases in professional staff salaries and benefits at the current staffing levels. For fiscal year 2024 to 25, $1,163,460. For the school year, fiscal year 2025 to 26, $498,861. And for the 2026 to 27 fiscal year, $478,808. And further, to raise and appropriate a sum of $1,163,460 for the fisc first fiscal year, that's the 2024-25 school year, such sum representing the additional costs attributable to the increase in professional staff salaries and benefits required by the new agreement over those that would be paid at current staffing levels. Majority vote required. The school board recommends this by a vote of six to one to zero. The budget committee does not recommend this by a vote of four against and three in favor. The estimated net tax impact of this article is 28 cents per thousand for Hollis and 44 cents a thousand for Brookline. Moved by Kate Stahl, seconded by Krista Whalen, Ms. Whalen. Oh, I guess I, I guess it was done by Tom Solon. I can you, here, take it. My notes are wrong. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, my name is Tom Solon. I'm on the Co-op School Board, and I want to thank you all for listening to me ramble on. Uh, the teams for the negotiation included myself, uh, Holly Durlu Babcock, and Cindy Van Conant from the Co-op Board, Gina Bergskog, our Assistant Superintendent and Superintendent-Elect, Kelly Seeley, our Business Administrator, and Tom Clausen, our uh, Attorney. For the uh, Hollis Education Association, they're represented by Stacy Plummer, Jennifer Staub, Justin Ballou, Karen Kutu, and, and uh, as staff members from the co-op, and Lori Hayes as a representative for the association. Um, give me a moment here. 1970, uh, Nashua, Nashua school system had a teacher strike. I think it lasted six or eight weeks. I was in junior high at that time, and uh, <clears throat> some of my classmates, one of whom, there, his mother was, I believe, the school librarian for the Hollis High School, Mrs. March. I don't know if there's anyone around who might remember those days, but uh, she convinced her son and several of my classmates to leave the Nashua school system, although we were Nashua residents, and to <clears throat> tuition into the Hollis school system and they stayed there to the point of graduation. Over 50 years ago, Hollis had a reputation for academics, uh, even when it was a much smaller town than it is now. That reputation permeates our communities, and the school system is something that many are proud of, and it impacts many of the decisions that are made. Uh, Schools aren't cheap. Education isn't cheap. Anyone who's contemplating sending a child to private school or looking at the cost of secondary education is acutely aware of that. However, <clears throat> as uh, Ms. Mann showed in the earlier slides, we do an exceptional job of keeping costs in line and often below average for the state. Uh, but we get exceptional performance, and that's not by accident. <clears throat> the contract that we're going to be talking about tonight is closely tied to those facts because the most impactful portion of our schools is our staff. And if we want to have the results we've had in the past, it would be good to continue doing what we did in the past, which is to support our teaching staff. if I can make this work. How do you win? It's a little so difficult. We are looking at a three-year contract. It is for the middle school and the high school, and it will begin with July 1st of this year and <coughs> conclude on June 30th of 2027 for a total of three school years. Some of the accomplishments of this new contract will include increased interaction between students and teachers. This was a priority for the school board coming out of the, uh, the period of COVID where there were practices and habits developed which focused on some degree of isolation we felt it was very important to bring back the elements of in-person school that really make a difference to our student population. And uh, I'll take just a, a side note. We were one of the few school systems in the state, probably in the country, that remained open during COVID, but we still had to take a lot of precautions and introduce a lot of policies that created a, a feeling of isolation for many of our students. We want to get back to the comfort level and the engagement that has been so meaningful and, accept, uh, and uh, created exceptional performance for our students and our school. We are looking to implement advisory in the high school and for those of you who are familiar with ROCK in the middle school, it's a similar program. Uh, we can provide a lot of details. There's been a number of discussions about it, but it's, uh, it's identified as a best practice for 
successful uh, outcomes of the students in our school. <clears throat> we get our teachers back supervising study halls. This again was one of the activities that was um, somewhat lost during COVID. A big, a big component of this contract is to improve hiring competitiveness. And we'll talk to that in a little bit of detail. Uh, we've had a, a problem with attrition lately and we want, wanted to have a contract that would have staff willing, comfortable, and obligated to honor the contract terms. We want to get improved pay with equity, uh, improved pay equity with our peer districts and provide additional opportunities for leadership in the district, leadership specifically by the staff. We have an amazingly talented group and we want to leverage that excellence in a way that promotes professional development among the teachers, not just something that comes in from the outside. One thing I didn't put on the slide when I was generating it a few days ago, but has come to my attention as a big concern of people. Uh, one of the other elements in the contract, which was not viewed as being a real big item for this audience, but apparently is, is that there's a clause about student loan repayment for our teachers. Uh, I think there are some misconceptions about it. <clears throat> what the clause allows is for employees on steps one through five, so that means people who are in their first five years of their teaching career can request for assistance with loan repayment. It's a maximum of $1,000 per year and they would not be eligible if they are receiving any other repayment or forgiveness of their loans. So it's a maximum of $1,000. It's paid directly to the institution, meaning it has to be a, an approved, authorized uh, financial arrangement. It's not, uh, I gotta give my money back to my dad who paid for my college. Uh, this, is, this is legitimate loan repayment. It is <clears throat> capped at $20,000 a year for everyone. So if everyone who was eligible, and let's say if there were 50 people eligible for it and they all applied and were granted, it still would not exceed that amount. I'll get, show you something a little later that the possibility of it reaching that level is, is unlikely, but it would be a wonderful thing if we had the situation that made that worthwhile because it would say something about our staff. Um, and if the staff leaves before completing the following year in district, they must repay all reimbursement. So it's an incentive to keep our teachers in the district. Just to give you a little bit of background of where we are, <clears throat> this slide has two lines on it. The blue line is in the rate of inflation annualized, a rolling average over uh, the period from December of 2019 up until December of 2023. We were negotiating this contract in the period of, say, September through February of 2020 into 2021. I don't, know if you can, I don't know if you can see, but this is the period of very low inflation. It's right in here. So what we were faced with when we were having this negotiation, we, were, we had just gotten uh, off of a, an inflationary period. We were, getting into, we were uh, starting to deal with uh, some of the concerns of COVID just as we were wrapping up but primarily we were looking at historically low inflation. We negotiated a great contract. It was great for the district. It had very, very small increases. The red line shows the rate of <clears throat> increases that were offered to our contract during the period that we're in now. So for the first year of the, old, of the contract we're in now, there was a cost of living adjustment of 0.75% for our teachers. <clears throat> and that turns into the total raise for uh, most of our senior staff. The second year of the contract, that increased to 1.5%. 
and the third year that increased by 1.75%. During that same period, inflation rose to over 9%, and even now, where it's supposedly settled out, we're still in the range of 3 plus for uh, inflation, although it, it seems to be coming down. So what we have is a period where our, our staff, like many of us, we did not get a, an increase in income similar to inflation. So it set, set people back by a large margin. Now, this is not unique to the teachers. We all went through it. Um, but one of the things that may be a little bit unique to uh, the teaching situation is it's a really, really competitive market out there right now. There is a national shortage of, of teachers, and uh, as you'll see shortly, it put us at a competitive disadvantage in hiring and also in retaining staff. This graph here shows <clears throat> the, com the relative pay of our current contract year with some neighboring districts. The black line is Hollis Brookline Co-op. Uh, we have Amherst, Bedford, Exeter, Concord, and we also have the Hollis Elementary District and the Brookline Elementary Districts in here just for comparison. The Three, the four sets represent first bachelor step one, which means a first year teacher with only a bachelor's degree. The second is master step five, the second is master step 10. These are people with master's degrees or better, <clears throat> and five or 10 years of, uh, of time in, in district. And the last one, labeled max, it varied a little bit from one district to another, but this is typically 15 or more years in district. It may include <clears throat> masters plus 15 or 30 years of uh, 38 credit hours. Some districts have pay for people with doctorates, special sections. But what I want to point out is most of our teachers in the co-op fall in the masters category, and many of them are in the category that I've labeled max. In those, for comparison purposes, um, Exeter, which is another co-op, is 40%, uh, approximately 40% higher pay than, than uh, Hollis Brookline for a master step 10. Um, Concord is 20% uh, higher. Uh, getting into the max category, which affects probably 40% of our staff. We've got Bedford at 23% higher than we are, and we've got uh, Exeter at um, more than 10% uh, more than 10% over. The point is, when, when you've got teachers who are leaving, where are they going? When you've got openings and you want to hire, where are they coming from and what else are they looking at? 81% of our staff is at least master's plus five years, master's step five. 59 are master's step 10 or higher, and a full 48% are master's uh, step 15 or higher. So we're really looking at the categories where our pay scale was at a competitive disadvantage. Okay, this actually shows the, the distribution of staffing in our district. And what this is, this is the full range of the degrees and the number of years of seniority in our district. <clears throat> the key point is that a, a large segment of our teaching population is in the master's category. That's, that's the center column. <clears throat> a disproportionate amount are centered down at the very lowest points of this, which is the highest level of seniority in our master's and higher section. 
So 41% of our staff are on the top step of their pay scale. What this means is that in any given year, they receive the COLA, or cost of living adjustment only. They do not get what we call step increases. So that 0.75, that 1.5, and that 1.75 were the total pay increases that these staff members received during those uh, successive years of the current contract. <clears throat> Next year, if there's no change in, uh, the, in our uh, staffing, 46%. So well over 50% of our payroll is relegated to the COLA adjustments only. So let's look at some numbers. <clears throat> What we're looking at for this actual contract is a first year which we're considering an adjustment, an adjustment to put us in line with com competitive and neighboring districts. And what makes a competitive district? Number one, they have a, a similar type of work environment. We're not comparing ourselves to Nashua and Manchester. We're comparing ourselves to Bedford and Amherst, to Wyndham, to districts that people move to, uh, when I say people, I'm talking staff members move to. Concord is a, is a common one. We've got a lot of teachers who live in the Bedford, sort of Gosstown area, and it's, a, it's, it's an equal kind of commute. Uh, we also look at other districts that have similar uh, demographics and, and structures. So we look at Oyster River, even though it's a, a, a bit of a richer district, we, but it, it has uh, similar demographics. We look at the Exeter area because they also are a co-op and similar demographics. So that's where we do our benchmarking. <clears throat> so the first year of the contract that we're proposing has a 10% increase to the table and then uh, like the existing table, step to step is 2.5%. So some portion of the staff will get as much as a 13% a, a thir increase this first year and all will get at least a 10% increase. Now, one of the things to point out is that with this adjustment, our salaries will get closer to com competing districts, but they're getting raises too this year. Um, it's equal plus or minus 1%. It'll put us equal plus or minus 1% to the Hollis Elementary District. So we're not talking about jumping up and being this landmark we're looking to get the co-op teachers in a similar pay scale to other teachers in our same SAU. Now all the other districts are going up, so wh whether we're going to achieve what we want, we don't know, but our staff has worked with us in negotiation and have accepted this proposal. Year two, now we're back to an inflation-style COLA adjustment. 3% to the table and the two and a half step increase for staff for longevity. So 46% of the staff will get a 3% raise and nothing more. And the others who are in that sort of central body of, of the uh, table that I showed you will get approximately uh, a 5.5% increase. And then the final year of the contract, the COLA drops again, as we hope inflation will as well. And we're at a 2.5% change to the table. And at that point, we'll, um, if we're able to retain our existing staff, we'll probably be dealing with about 50% of the staff will get that 2.5% raise. From a monetary standpoint, when you put all of the people together throughout the whole staffing level, you're looking at 10.9% uh, increase to the salary, 10.93 uh, if you add benefits of uh, uh, Social Security and New Hampshire retirement into that. We don't include the health in looking at it because that's a personal choice and it's not really, it's not really um, well collaborated, uh, no, uh, it's not well connected to people's seniority or position and it's also personal information that we don't necessarily have access to. Second year, <clears throat> the full increase is 4.31% including the uh, Social Security and retirement, and in year three, that drops down to about 4%. So over the course of this entire contract, the salary only increase 
is $1.67 $1 million with, all, with the Social Security and retirement. It's a little over $2 million. That's a really big number. That's a really big number. It's a big number I don't like. But the fact of the matter is, that's what our economy and our inflation needs to um, accept in order to keep us staffed. Litchfield has approved a two-year contract with a value of $1.26 million. Pelham has approved a, con a three-year contract with an increase of $2.26 million. Milford, right next door, approved a four-year contract for $3.74 million. So as uncomfortable as these numbers are, these are not unusual numbers. And again, we are already below state average in cost per pupil and in total budget. So as I said before, education is turning out to be expensive. Now some people say, how can we even talk about numbers this big? I didn't get this kind of an increase. These are not typical. Well, I'm sure we all saw what happened with United Auto Workers, saw with UPS. Those are the public ones. Some people have gotten some really, really good raises, and some people have gotten nothing or gone backwards, and some people are out of work. I understand that. We have to look at our schools as a standalone entity in the sense that we have a market that we're working in. We have an extremely successful program that we want to maintain. And we put before you a contract that we believe is fair to both the community and the staff. And most importantly, it's very good for our students, for our children. Because that's really where the focus is for all that we're doing here. Here's a small graph of what we've been faced with in recent years. What this is showing is the co-op staffing losses by contract year. So <clears throat> five, le less than 10 is typical. The blue is resignations and non-renewals. Those are ones where uh, the staff members are not officially retiring and starting to collect retirement system. We went from a, a non -renew, uh, excuse me, resignations and non-renewals of seven in, in FY20 to nine in FY21 to 15 in FY22 and to 19 in FY23. And in FY23, in addition to that, we had retirements and we had five positions unfilled. That's, that's kind of unheard of for us, to not only be in a situation where we lose that many staff members, but that we can't replace them. And it's not for lack of trying. It's because there are so many options out there. And especially at the entry point, they look at the pay table. Now, teachers look at things a little different. They don't look at what am I going to make this year. They have a map of what their career is going to offer if they come into our school district. That's what the step table offers. And they look at what's, what, where am I now? Where will I be in 15 years? And they count on the fact that there's going to be inflation adjustment, i.e. the COLA numbers we've talked about. And they look at what am I going to get as I become a more experienced and more, more valuable uh, teacher. And right now, pay scale we have is not cutting it, just isn't cutting it. So what we are faced with is an adjustment. And I, I ask that you look at that. Don't look at year one as they're getting this enormous raise. And I worked in tech for a number of years. And it was not uncommon for there to be industry assessments done. And periodically, we would get notified that there had been a survey done. Now, I worked for Digital Equipment Corporation for a while, and they came through. We had 130,000 employees worldwide. And they'd come through, and they'd look, and they'd say, we have done a competitive analysis, and this is what has to happen. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, 
I get a 6 or 7% raise or a 10% raise because that's what the industry was driving. That mechanism doesn't really happen. And where it happens is when we look at contracts year to year, we try to reposition ourselves. Will this ever happen again? I can't tell you it won't. I don't know. But I can tell you that right now, in my opinion, and I think the opinion of my colleagues on the board, and certainly in the opinion of the people who are, who are uh, in our classrooms, if we don't make a change, there's likely to be increasing attrition. We have a good thing going. We've got loyal teachers. We have the people who showed up when other teachers wouldn't. We had teachers in our schools, what we call room and Zoom. They were not only teaching the staff, uh, the students that were in class, but they were simultaneously teaching remotely. Something that was claimed in the publications that not only it couldn't be done, but even if it could, it wouldn't be done. So I think it's time for us to stand up and accept the fact that we've got a great school system, we value it, and there is a cost to keeping it running. So please vote yes. Thank you very much, and I appreciate your patience. I have a petition here for a ballot vote, so when we finish talking, we will be taking a ballot vote on this article. <clears throat> yes, ma'am. Kirsten Warney, Ironworks Lane, Hollis. Good evening. I know that Mr. Solon just pointed out that for first year teachers, it's going to be a 10% increase. It's not a raise, it's just an adjustment. If you think about it, I get it. 10% sounds huge. I looked up the median income of Hollis Brookline residents, and according to Nielsen, it's approximately $156,000. A 10% raise on $156,000 is a lot. It's 15 k That is a huge raise. I get it. It sounds like a lot. We need to go back and say, but this is a teacher's salary who is making $46,000. I'm just trying to do the actual math of this. A 10% raise for a teacher that's making $46,000 is $4,600. It's a very small portion. It's not 10% of a huge number. We need our teachers. We need to keep them happy. We need to keep them in this district. 10%, you need to think about it. It's not apples to apples when I compare my salary to an engineer's salary. It's not the same. I support, I support the teachers, and I support a vote of yes on Article 2. The teachers work hard. Yes, sir. Hi, uh, I'm Devin Photo. I don't live in the district, but I'm seeking permission to speak on the grounds that I lived in Brookline for 15 years. Uh, I went through the co-op, and I've been a teacher for six years in the district. The gentleman is not a voter here, is that correct? And he's asking correct. for permission to speak. If you, <coughs> if you wish to let him speak, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, raise your cards. Yes, sir, you have two minutes. Thank you. Um, so the 2024 salary increase does seem large out of context, but in context, uh, in 2020 we agreed to a contract where we only received a three quarter percent, one and a half percent, and one and three quarter percent salary increase, which totals to an average of 1.3 percent annually. Since then, in private industry, where they're getting promotions and other raises, their COLA increase was 4.1 percent. Uh, among federal employees, 3.6 percent, and in the military. 3.9%. In that time, our salaries have lagged behind all of these industries and will continue to lag behind. We're only getting one third of what those industries have gotten. Um, we had no way of knowing that the post-COVID recession wouldn't come. Uh, and, and in fact, inflation's hit its highest point since 1982. If we had known that, maybe we could have negotiated a 3.5% raise over these last few years where we would have ended up uh, in line with these other industries. Uh, and in fact, our 2024 ask gets us back in line with that 3.5% over four years. If you do the average out, we get 3.45% over four years. 
Um, to reiterate, because we agreed to such a thin contract in 2020, the proposed contract in 2024 only amounts to an average raise of 3.4% over four years. This keeps us competitive with other industries and with other districts, um, where the cost of living adjustments have all exceeded 3.5%. Uh, and these industries, based on their salary increases, uh, they, they based their salary increases on the knowledge of inflation. They knew this was happening, so they were able to make those adjustments. We have not been able to make those adjustments. Now we need to make a correction in face of inflation with the hindsight of inflation so that we can keep competitiveness with other districts and with other industries. Thank you. Becky Balfour, Van Dyke Road, Hollis. I'm speaking here tonight to share how our high school has lost its ability to attract the best candidates. Jennifer Staub has been my social studies department chair for the past 15 years and has interviewed dozens of candidates. She and other department chairs report that the applicant pool has changed in recent years. One high school, once, our high school, once had the reputation of being a receiving school where top teachers would jump at the chance to apply here. Ms. Staub and other department chairs recall many instances where they had a dozen or more highly qualified applicants applying for one position. More often than not, they were able to secure their first choice candidate. That's changed. There's a teacher shortage everywhere. Veteran teachers are leaving the profession and younger people are choosing not to teach. We have fewer applicants for open positions and the highly qualified applicants, the ones HB used to attract, are choosing districts with higher salaries. HB can no longer be called a receiving school. We're currently a sending school. We're training and mentoring teachers with great potential who then leave HB for opportunities elsewhere. This pattern will continue if we cannot offer a competitive salary. We can no longer count on our prior reputation to draw the best candidates. Many of my colleagues have shared with me that they're waiting to see if Article 2 passes tonight to decide if they will stay at HB or apply to a more competitive district or join the private sector, which understands the skill set teachers bring to their industry. Some will decide whether they'll retire or continue teaching. Passing this contract is essential to maintaining the ex excellence our co-op is known for. Please vote yes on Article 2, support our students and staff, and maintain HB's excellent reputation. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, Christina Brown, Hood Road, Brookline. You can tilt the mallet down so it's, there you go, much better. <laughs> During the spring of 2020, staff taught students via Zoom without any training. Schools closed on a Friday and many were Zooming by the following month, Wednesday. 2021-2022 school year, except for a few weeks around the winter holidays, HBMS and HBHS were open five days a week for students, while schools across the state and country were closed and only educating students remotely. For the entire school year, most of us performed two jobs at the same time educating students who were in the room with us while also educating students at home over Zoom. It was grueling. Staff has spent every day since and before COVID covering classes for other teachers as we do not have enough substitutes to cover classes. We have staff members who have taught a sixth class to cover due to staff shortages. Staff spend an untold number of unpaid hours each year in and year out volunteering on committees and for clubs. Staff spend countless hours of unpaid time writing letters of recommendations for colleges, private schools, and summer programs for students. In the last round of contract negotiations, we accepted incredibly small pay increases in anticipation of a recession that never happened. Our pay increase from last year to this year was a meager 1.75%, but every aspect of our job has become more challenging. HBMS and HBHS teachers were there for your children and families of this community when they needed us the most in the last four years. It is time for the community to show us the same level of support and commitment by adjusting our salaries to levels that are fair and aligned with the value of the work that we perform. Thank you.
Yes, ma'am. My name is Paula Cattell. I live in Hollis. I'm in New New Hampshire. Just moved a year ago. Welcome. And I'm here to say I feel the most democratic I've ever felt being here tonight. The hardest job in the world is to be a parent. The second hardest job in the world is to be a teacher. Teachers shape, mold, and develop the next generation. And looking at that amount of responsibility compared to their average salary, it's totally disproportionate. I am in complete favor of this article, and I would say to any of you who are worried about your taxes going up, just think about the fact that the quality of the school department in your town directly affects your property value. <laughs> Earlier it was said that, and this, is new, this was news to me, that Hollis Brookline High School is the number six in the state. It didn't get there because of this beautiful building. It got there because of the teachers. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Judy McDaniel, Quentin Drive in Brookline. Um, I have been a mathematics teacher here at HBHS for over 20 years. I am proud to be a teacher and I love what I do. Uh, prior to being an educator, I worked in the private sector and I will say that teaching is the both mo most rewarding and the most challenging job I've ever had. This was especially true at two times in my career during the COVID years and um, when I was a brand new teacher starting from scratch. And I'd just like to point out under our current contract, the starting salary for our least experienced teachers is below $47,000. Um, teachers are drawn into education to share their love of the subject they teach and to make a difference in their students' lives. They do not go into teaching to get rich. However, just like everyone else, we need to pay our bills um, and support our families. So while I'm in the latter part of my teaching career, um, I am really concerned about the younger teachers. We have some in the math department and they're trying to get started. They're trying, they're, you know, newly married. They're trying to, you know, establish themselves um, with a home and, and that sort of thing. And those pay tables that we see in the contract are so important to them. They know they're not going to get a lot of money that first year. And the way we keep them is by having those pay tables competitive so that they can see, okay, in 10 years, 15 years, I can make, um, you know, a competitive living. Um, we have, as others have mentioned, we've had a lot of um, issues with teachers leaving. We, there are fewer, teacher, um, fewer students um, leaving college with the intent to teach, and HB has not been immune to that. It's been an issue here. Um, I will just finish up by saying my own two children went to Hollis Brookline schools from grades one through 12. They had excellent teachers. They, had, um, they came out with an education that prepared them very well for their college careers. And I ask you to please support Article 2 in order to keep our schools operating at the high level that we expect in our district. Thank you. Ms. Roy. Hello, Mr. Moderator. Carol Roy, South Merrimack Road, Hollis. Um, I am a parent of a student in sixth grade at Hughes, which means this contract is going to directly affect the education that she and her sister a couple years behind her are going to get. I have enjoyed being a member of the Hollis community and coming to these very spirited meetings for all of these years. And I think we all have the best at heart in the things that we believe in. Well, I believe in our teaching staff. It is not an accident, it is not a coincidence that the students of the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District go on to do incredible things. They're doing incredible things while they're here. Yeah, they're great kids. There are awesome parents in these communities, but they come into these school districts wanting knowledge and wanting to be heard. And these teachers give them that knowledge. They hear them, they guide them, they grow them, and then they help release them to be the wonderful people that we all see making huge differences in the world when they graduate. This is not an accident. It is because of the teaching staff in the cooperative school district that this can happen. Please do not deny the future co-op students the opportunity to experience that teaching greatness. Please vote yes on Article 2.
Yes, sir. Uh, yes, jo sir. Joseph Hartman, Mountain Road, Brookline. I move the motion to... Uh, you move to end debate. Yes. <laughs> um, could you tell me your name again, please? Joseph Hartman, H-A-R-T-M-A-N. Joseph Hartman. Is there a second? Second by Mr. Harris. This is not debatable, and it requires a two-thirds vote. If this motion passes, is there anyone behind you, Mr. Power? Who's the last in line? All right, the gentleman in the brown jack, uh, brown sweater. <clears throat> if this motion passes, he's the last speaker. If you are in favor of ending debate on this article, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the ayes have it. Mr. Beaches. Uh, yes, I note that the school board, one member of the school board, did not recommend this article. And I guess also four members of the budget committee also did not recommend this. I would like them individually to uh, explain the rationale. I'm sure they all have the best interests of the students at heart, but I would like to understand uh, why they're not fully supporting this. Does anybody from the school board wish to speak to this? The question is, uh, the person who voted against it, would, would that, that person speak to why they voted against it? Um, oh, here she comes. I was going to say the person who voted against it isn't here, but she's returning. Beth Williams, Brookline School Board member. Um, the biggest part of it, I would like to say first that I lost a lot of sleep over this article. This is a really tough one. I believe our teachers deserve this and more, but my vote was actually very much influenced by our finance committee based on their information and, and the amount of time they spend on it, but that's all. Does anybody from the budget committee want to speak to this? Ms. Mann. So as you noted, um, the budget committee was split on this vote and we did have members that recognized the competitive nature of the teaching of uh, the profession itself and valued the, and recognized the value of uh, many of the elements that were included in the contract. We did have four members, however, who, um, had some concerns about the front loading of the costs in the first year because it's a significant increase to the step table in the first year of the contract. We also had um, some members who recognized that while though a, a significant portion of the teachers were on that, that last step of the step table and did receive the cumulative 4% increase over the last contract, there was a majority of teachers who were not on that last step of the step table, and they received an approximate 12% increase over the term of the contract. And when balanced against the CPI, that's significantly greater. 12% over three years you know, might still look like um, a significant gap, but it's a gap everybody felt across all of our communities. And we really did, for those um, teachers that were on the contract felt that it was, you know, continued to be fairly negotiated and agreed to. And, you know, just in recognition of the fact that there is a two and a half percent increase of anyone within the table itself. So if you were not on that top step of the last contract, you received the two and a half percent increase in addition to the 0.75 and then the next year, two and a half percent and 1.5 and two and a half percent and 1.75. Um, there uh, is uh, always concern about, uh, among um, various individuals, about sandbernizing the contract, which is agreeing to all three years um, of the contract at once. When we get to the support staff contract, that's a contract that um, has not been sandbernized, and it's something we vote on every year. So those are the, some of the reasons. Are there any other members of the budget committee with different uh, explanations? 
Mr. Blanchet. Raul Blanchet, um, in addition to the points that she made, uh, for me it was a tough decision. I felt that it was the wrong time. Under normal circumstances in previous years, I would have supported this contract. However, we just, the town of Hollis just went through a major revaluation, and to many taxpayers, they, were, they had significant increases in their taxes. So I felt that, again, under normal circumstances, I would have voted for it, but not this year. So I felt the timing was right. I also was concerned about the front loading. I was concerned about the total average per person. Um, if you divide a $2.1 million contract over three years, over 114 staff members in total, it averages to about $6,200 per year in addition to the other, per, other increases in the table. So it just, it was a combination of factors. There was no, not, I am not against anybody trying to get their highest salary possible at any time, but I felt under all the circumstances, this particular year, the timing wasn't just right. I would have maybe supported it, giving everything else, if it would have been equally loaded. In other words, have the same percentage per year, rather than from loading it. Thank, Thank you. you. I have no further questions. Oh, unless another gentleman wants to speak. Mr. Stanisi. I, too, found it very, very difficult to come to this disagreement, I don't want to say disagreement, not really in favor because a lot of the things that have already been mentioned, I understand the school performs very, very well. It has nothing to do with any of the teaching and the quality of the teaching that the students get. You can look through a lot of different rankings and you see Hollis is way up there. I felt it very, very difficult to not support it. Some of the reasons came up with regards to um, San Bernice. Um, at this particular time, with all of the costs that the community is seeing, it's difficult to add this on top of it. If there was a way that we could suspend um, this contract for a year and maintain basically what we had for the past year and see no changes, I would have accepted that with changes to take place as we go on. But unfortunately, that's not on the table. At least, I don't think it's on the table or could be on the table. So that was my reason, is that we just stuck between a rock and a hard place. And that was my decision. Thank you very much. At this time, it is 926. Is there anyone in the room who still needs to vote on Article 9? Seeing none, I close the polls on Article 9. Let the counting begin. <clears throat> Mr. McGuire. All right, I'm Matt McGuire. Um, a lot, for a lot of the same points that were already made, um, you know, the, the timing of this, uh, there was a big, you know, tax increase last year. Um, I know the teachers are very much deserving of a raise but between the sanitization, the large tax increase last year, and you know, overall I would like to have seen it not front loaded like that, maybe more evenly distributed over the three years with maybe just a little bit less to kind of lessen the, the tax impact to everybody. But you know, with all the, across the three different districts and what we're doing um, with our, all our warrant articles and budget, I just thought it was a little bit high given the circumstances and the timing even knowing it's much um, deserved. It's just hard, you know, like I said, there's a lot of, between last year's taxes and what we're doing this year for taxes and what's on the budget, it was a lot of money. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Karen Belmonte, Troll Road, Hollis. Um, I just wanted to share my experience for those here today that don't have a student in the co-op. Last year, my eighth grader had three teachers leave in the middle of the school year. And that was in addition to one uh, a tech ed teacher that was a role they couldn't fill. She had a lot of extra study halls, a lot of missed instruction, 
This is affecting students. We need to do something about it now. We need to support our school's greatest assets, our teachers. Please vote yes. Yes, ma'am. Kathy Levitt, Birch Hill Road, Brookline. In the interest of time, I'll keep this brief. Do you I'm have a voting card? Yes, I do, and it's right here. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. I had to have my husband bring it to me. I forgot it. Um, I, too, am a public school teacher. I know what you're going through. Um, people who do not work in education simply have no understanding of what it takes to be an effective educator these days. And I mean no disrespect to people who aren't public school educators, but it is, it is a hard job. It is the best job but it is a really hard job. I've heard that we should suspend the contract for a year. The time is just not right. Maybe if we weren't asking for so much right away at this point, but teachers cannot wait. And as, as we've heard, they're not waiting. There are currently unfilled positions. By the way, Nashua is hiring. We have an excellent teachers union. We need to pass this budget. We can afford it. Our teachers' working conditions are your children's learning conditions. Thank you. Ms. St. John. Yep, Michelle St. John, Orchard Drive. I actually have a question um, that I'd like to ask of our um, Superintendent, based on some of this discussion that came up about the reasoning for not supporting the contract, um, and hearing the presentations and hearing the um, the sacrifice that our teachers have been ma making since accepting a contract that was much lower three years ago. Um, so um, I'd like to ask Andy, you know, what the staffing implications would be if Article 2 fails? What happens? What, you know, very curious, and I'm sure there's many people in the room that are also curious. And if I can, before, after Andy answers, if you could pause my time, I have a couple more hmm. comments. Um, if the teachers were not able to get a contract, I do agree that some of them would look. We have some very talented individuals, uh, math, science, tech ed, in crucial areas that every school district is looking for. The same with special education. Um, and I think they would feel an obligation to their families to look. Uh, like myself, they very much enjoy working here. We um, enjoy coming in and working with the students and watching them grow. If the teachers uh, don't get a contract, um, they could decide to work to rule. Uh, and working to rule means that they come in on time, they leave on time, and they teach their required classes. But they wouldn't be obligated to do the extra tutoring that they provide. They wouldn't be obligated to write letters of recommendation, say, for eighth graders going to a private school in grade nine or for seniors going to college. Now, I say that, but our union has always been different. You know, when we went through COVID, they sat at the table with me, and we figured out how to make it work. So I, I want the community to know those are possibilities. But when I hear the horror stories of some of the unions across the country and some of the things that are done, um, I haven't encountered that in my decade here. I've encountered good people working hard who want the best colleague in the classroom next door. Uh, so that's what I think you'd see happen, uh, but I do think you'd see some people have to look. Go ahead. I, oh, sorry. Um, so the other comment I heard budget committee members mention was, you know, the um, reevaluation, the home assessments and rate taxes are being raised as a result of that, and we're all feeling that pinch, right? Um, I also just want to point out that there is a percentage of our teachers living in our community who also have to pay that increase in their property tax.
and, and they shouldn't be penalized for that just because we are saying that no more. Um, and lastly, I just want to say as a parent with two students, one a recent graduate, my son is thriving. He's, he's excelling where he is. And I would like to thank the Hollis Brookline teachers every step of the way to get him where he is today. If it wasn't for you, I don't think he'd be half the person that he is today. So thank you. Yes, sir. Brian Loveland, uh, Toddy Brook Road. And I think everyone can agree that the contract the teacher signed in 2020 was them taking a uh, pay cut and showing uh, that they were bending over backwards for us. The raise this year is not a raise. It's an adjustment to account for the fact that what was they, when they took the pay cut, uh, it wasn't a real pay cut, but with inflation, it was a, um, a pay cut that we need to fix the teachers' salaries now. It's something where it's not, uh, we can wait a year or two because they have expenses and they not need to support their families. And if we can't support them, why would they support us? The um, co-op provides a better education, not number six or number three, depending on not the various surveys for a, a below average cost. They um, need our support to continue this thriving uh, town. And the, there's a nationwide ch teacher shortage. So if you think, oh, well, we can just get new teachers, as um, a previous speaker, speaker said, that uh, uh, there's a hard time um, finding replacements. And if you think it was a hard time um, before this contract were to get voted down, think about it afterwards where we're sending a signal that we don't support our teachers. For all these reasons, I vehemently support this contract and think that the teachers are owed this, and thank you. Yes, ma'am. Charity Bell Lewitt, uh, Forens Drive in Hollis. Um, I have a 14-year-old boy who is in school here, and I also have the pleasure of working with schools across the, across New England and across the country on a variety of topics. And one of the things that I find most amazing is the idea that anybody would think that our teachers are trying to get the most money possible with this contract. There's not a single teacher that could not walk out of this room this evening and find a job that paid them more. That's just the fact. If we decide not to pass this contract, what we're actually just saying is we don't want our kids to have the best. We have some of the most amazing kids, but we also have some of the most demanding parents. <laughs> I'm not gonna lie. I work with a lot of school systems and we have very high expectations of our teachers and the way that they will support our children. And those expectations come at a, a price that is far, far above what we are currently paying. I will tell you that people in school systems across this state have not a chance in hell of getting the kind of support and services that our kids get. It's an extraordinary opportunity. We want the best for our kids. And I will say, as someone who hires every single day in my job, I am hiring people who are nowhere near the quality that I hired before COVID. If we decide that we're gonna staff our schools with the people who are currently available for less money than any place else pays, that just doesn't make sense. When you move to an, a, a, a community like this, you take on the job of being an employer. I am an employer, and therefore, it is my responsibility to be the employer of choice. In order for my child to have the education he needs, and. I really just thank all you again for that whole thing. Like, you taught him algebra, which is like a combat pay. Um, but in order for my child to get the education that he deserves, I'm going to stretch a little bit. I'm going to make sure that I'm able to do this for you. Not because you're going to be the best paid teachers in the state, far from it, but because what we need to do is stand up and give our support to those who have supported us. Finish thank up, you. Please. <laughs> Yes, ma'am. Stacy Plummer, Taylor Drive, Brookline. 
Most of you in this room know me as Mrs. Plummer, the often too exuberant math teacher here at Hollis Brookline High School. For the past 25 years, I have worked in this building alongside the most committed middle and high school teachers you will ever find. In case you were not aware before Charity just spoke, this is a challenging and difficult community to teach in. This community pays attention, gets involved, holds us accountable. This community truly cares about what is going on in our schools. This community has high standards and high expectations. It takes specially committed and highly talented teachers to be successful in this district. And we have two buildings full of them. Teachers who thrive on wanting to meet your high expectations and contribute to making this one of the top school districts in the state of New Hampshire year after year. Teachers who day in and day out make sacrifices for the adolescents in this community to make sure they are cared for, educated, and on a pathway to become the best version of themselves they can be. You've heard many other speakers talk about many of the sacrifices we make daily, but the discussion tonight centers around the financial sacrifice we made in 2021. Out of an abundance of caution for this community's financial future, during that uncertain time, we sacrificed our paychecks. We agreed to accept meager pay increases for the last three school years, while we, just like you, watched our heating costs, grocery bills, and college tuition bills go up and up. We had to make sacrifices to make this work, but it is unreasonable to expect your teachers to continue to sacrifice their families' financial futures. This community has a critical decision to make tonight that will have an enormous impact either way. Will you make a sacrifice to retain the quality of education this district provides itself in? Will you make a sacrifice for the adolescents in this community? I hope so. Vote yes on Article 2. Yes, sir. Barry Doyle, uh, Rocky Pond Road. I'm just curious, is the increases merit-based at all, or is it just across the board? I'd rather a short one, but... <laughs> The short answer is no, they are not merit-based. They are based on the number of years in service and the credentials that they have. So it's a service-based increase. Each additional year, a staff member moves up one step or moves down one step on the table. A step in the current table and the proposed table represents a 2.5% increase in salary by movement. Okay, because while our uh, teachers are outstanding, I'm not taking anything away from them. I'm sure they're not all A-plus teachers where some can get a 13% raise, some could get an 11% rate, you know. It, 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 it should fluctuate a little bit, I would think, just like in the business world, that not everybody gets their whopping 3% or whatever it is. There's others that get 2%, some will get a 4%. Um, I don't know if that's been taken into consideration at all. The nature of, uh, of the collecting, collective bargaining agreement is that we treat <clears throat> the staff as a equivalent class. Um, we do not have the legal ability to negotiate with any individual so on a, a separate whole. basis. So we're not permitted by law to, to uh, adjust pay from one individual to another because of the nature of a collective bargaining agreement. So it's all in, just all. Yeah, that's, that, that's, that's the impact of unionization. Okay, thank you very much. Mr. Enright. Tom Enright, Orchard Drive, Hollis. I want to uh, say a word on sambernization. I was uh, against it uh, much longer than I've been for it. Um, but this meeting changed my mind. I've been involved over 30 years in at least 20 multi-year contracts between the teachers and the support staff. There has never been an instance, never, that we have voted down year two or year three of a contract having once heard the contract, and approved year one. So, sambernization 
is, is not an issue in my mind. I want to just read a couple of uh, questions that I've been asking myself. What happens if we turn the contract down tonight? We will be left with 114 teachers who have been underpaid for three years and now see no light going forward. The hiring season starts in two months and the supply of teacher candidates is low. We already have a hiring and retention problem at the co-op. How much does that problem multiply with no con contract? What will be the incentive to not head for the door and find a $5,000 to $10,000 salary increase 20 minutes away? How do we reduce a contract price tag if the c current proposal is only getting us just back to competitiveness? I'm worried about, uh, I'm an optimist, but I'm worried about this vote, although i less worried uh, after hearing everybody. I'm not sure that we realize we are in a precarious spot. If we make an ill-conceived move tonight, it will be difficult to recover soon. Thank you. Wait. I have the vote here on Article 9. Yes, 264, no, 393. The article fails. <laughs> Mr. Power. Eric Power, Westview Road, Brookline. Speaking in, in, against this article, I, w I served on the co-op school board for three years. I know about the teachers and I know that it's a challenging position and um, we do want to give the teachers a raise. I had two children go through the co-op K through 12 graduate. Um, I also served in the Air Force for 30 years. I didn't serve in the Air Force for the pay. The, you know the military pay is not top pay compared to civilian pay. But I did it because I enjoyed serving the country. So when I look at this teacher's contract, I'm concerned because it's, it's $2.1 million of increases over the next three years, and I agree with the budget committee, that's too much, including more than $1.1 million the first year. You know, we're talking about on-step teachers getting over 25% raises in three years. Uh, it was justified as a COVID correction, but taxpayers didn't get a COVID correction. And, you know, our taxes in Brookline in the co-op are over a over dollar a thousand with this driving part of that. I would say that you, they didn't talk too much about Cadillac benefits. They get 100% paid medical if they're single, 90% paid if they're family. 12 sick days, three personal days, 85% paid long-term disability life insurance. A sabbatical they can apply for every five years at 50% pay. New Hampshire retirement system. The department chairs are getting an extra 12% now with this new contract instead of 8%. They get $50 an hour for creating or providing in-district in professional development activities. That's a new benefit. $20,000 in student loan repayment. They, you heard about that. And at the end of this contract, a top teacher will make $102,162. And if you're a department chair, $114,421. That's a lot of money. They, don't, they work 37 weeks a year where the rest of us work 48 weeks a year. So I think you have to look at all everything in perspective. We have, we, have, we, have good, we have great schools because you know, they, that drives great housing values. But at some point, the taxes, and especially in Brookline and, and soon in Hollis, come to a point where people don't want to purchase homes and the values will go down because the taxes are sky high. I don't like the sambronization. I think it should have been done in three years, one year at a time. That's why we got hurt by this last contract. It was locked in for three years. So I vote, I would recommend people vote no on this, go back and have a more reasonable contract. I agree with the budget committee. Thank you. Um, Mr. Buto, I, I think the gentleman in front of you had already. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Um, Bethany Beck for Maxwell Drive in Brookline. 
I can promise you that 23 years ago when I walked out of university, I never thought I would be standing in front of my community begging to be paid what I am worth. But here we are. A couple years ago, we moved 800 miles with the only goal being that we were within 60 mile radius of Boston Logan. That left hundreds of districts to research and ultimately we chose HBHS. The fact is this district needs families to continue to move in. That increases our tax base. Families move in for the schools and schools are made by good teachers. I will say that these critics will say that these families will eventually move away after their kids graduate. But that's not true, because guess what? New ones move in, just as we did. I have, a, I have two children here, one who is in fifth grade and one who is a senior, and my senior last year felt the sting of staff shortages. For example, in math, he had four different math teachers in his junior year, a critical year for SATs. However, HBHS has been nothing short of perfect for him and has helped him to be accepted into some of the most competitive universities. I want that same opportunity for my 11-year-old. I have taught 23 years in an urban district, a suburban district, and now a rural district. Good teaching is good teaching, and I know that I will be an effective teacher wherever I go. But the truth is, this is also a job. This pays my bills. I ask that you don't force these educators to have to choose between a place that they love and the ability to, make a to, ta uh, to take a significant increase in pay to support their families. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mike Raimondi, 62 Alston Drive. I came here tonight um, expecting to be against this article. Uh, I listened to some of the testimony and it started to soften me up a bit. Uh, I heard about a teacher making $43,000 a year with this, I saw this handout talking about 0.75% increases, 1.5% of 1.75% increases, and I started thinking, hey, maybe I'm wrong. But now I hear there's a 2.5% base underneath that, unless I'm mistaken, that this is kind of deceptive, that this term pay cut that I heard is deceptive that we're being that there's not transparency here that in fact this 0.75 percent increase must be a 3.25 percent increase and this 1.75 percent increase must really be to 4.25 percent increase except of course for the top 40 percent teachers I understand that the teachers that are maxed out but we weren't that wasn't disclosed to us it was disclosed it was treated as if all the teachers were on the 40 percent maxed out and weren't getting a 2.5 percent um, step. So I find that very disingenuous. I'm very offended by that given the tax rates that have gone up and skyrocketed in this town. I hear that you have a hundred percent medical coverage. Are you kidding me? Is there anybody in the world that has that? That's got to be worth seven thousand dollars a year as well. So there's forty three thousand, you're up to fifty three, fifty thousand, two, three percent, four percent pay increases, Unless I'm mistaken, and I'm willing to be corrected, um, I'm turning back to being against this, and I'll stop now. No. No. All discussion on this article has, has finished. It is time to vote. Mr. Buto. Moderator, um, I would like to move to restrict reconsideration of Article 9 before we vote. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. Um, seconded by Mr. Harris. The motion is, no, is to restrict reconsideration of Article 9. If you wish to restrict reconsideration of Article 9, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, raise your cards. And the article is restricted. Now, what, what we have is a ballot vote on Article 2. It is a yes-no vote. It is a simple majority. If you are in favor, fill in the circle for yes. If you are opposed, fill in the circle for no. If you don't have a new ballot, go to any of the ballot clerks. They will stamp your voting card and give you a new ballot. The polls are now open.
Is there anyone in the room who still needs to vote on Article 2? Well, time to vote now. While we're in idle time, I would like to poll the voters here. How, the question I would like to ask you is whether you would prefer a meeting on the evening or prefer a meeting on Saturday. So if you're happy with an evening meeting, please raise your cards. The question is, would you rather have an evening meeting or a Saturday meeting? If you'd rather, this is simply a, a polling the voters here. There's no, nothing binding in what we're doing. If you'd rather have the meeting on an evening, raise your cards. Thank you. If you'd rather have it on a Saturday, raise your cards. I think there were more people for, in favor of evening. No, we can't do it on a Sunday, by law. All right, if, ever, if everybody has voted on this article, uh, I will close the polls. The polls are now closed. You can start counting. Oh, we still have one person to vote. There you go. All right, folks, it's 10 o'clock. We've been at this for three and a half hours and we've gotten through two articles. If we want to finish tonight before the wee hours, we need to step it up because otherwise it's going into the, late tonight or we're gonna have to have a second session later in this week. So I would like to ask people to keep your comments short and keep focused. Article 1. Collective bargaining agreement with Hollis Education Support Staff Association to see if the school district will vote to approve the cost items of the fourth year of a four-year collective bargaining agreement reached between the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School Board and the Hollis Education Support Staff Association for the 2021-22, 22-23, 23-24, 20, and 24-25 school years, which calls for the following increases in support staff salaries and benefits at the current staffing levels. For fiscal year 24-25, an estimated increase of $82,473. And further, to raise and appropriate a sum of $82,473 for the fourth fiscal year, 2024-25 school year, such sum representing the additional costs attributable to the increase in support staff salaries and benefits required by the new agreement over those that would be paid at current staffing levels. Majority vote required. The school board recommends this by a vote 7-0-0. The budget committee recommends this by a 6-0 vote with one abstention. Estimated net tax impact is four cents a thousand for Brookline and two cents a thousand for Hollis. Moved by Kate Stahl, seconded by Krista Whalen, Ms. Whalen. Good evening. I will do my best to keep this short so we can keep moving. Um, the support staff consists of our paraprofessionals, our custodians, our secretaries, and our food service workers. Critical staff that we need to keep our schools working and for our students. Um, we opened the contract last year. It was, it was the third year. Last year was the third year of a three-year contract, but we opened it due to 
the things that we've been dealing with, the teachers, loss of employees and our inability to fill positions. We adjusted the rate structure and extended the collective bargaining agreement by one year. The FY changes include a 3.5% increase for both on-step and off-step, no insurance changes, and our starting salary on the step table will be $15.53, and that is up from $15. That is it. Please support Article 1. Thank you. I am now open for debate. Yes, ma'am. Cheryl Hinckley, 52 Silver Lake Road. I would like to move that we do not debate on this subject. It is four cents per thousand. We have just did $11 per thousand for the teachers. This support staff is no less worthy. $83,000 is nothing and Everybody here already supports it, so I'd like to move that we please do not continue. We have so many other things to talk about. Let's just give them what they deserve. I'm not going to entertain the motion per se, but I only see one more, one more person in line. Ms. Farid. Tammy Farid Hollis. Um, I would like to comment that during COVID, the school districts returned millions of dollars in unexpended funds to the taxpayers. Seeing no further speakers, it is time to vote on Article 1, which is a HESA contract with the school, board, the school district. If you are in favor of Article 1, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the ayes have it. That's the kind of motion I like to see. <laughs> Article three is the school operating budget. To see if the school district will vote to raise and appropriate a sum of $28,058,084 for the support of schools, for the payment of salaries for the school district officials and, and agents, and for the payment of statutory obligations of the district. This appropriation does not include appropriations voted in other warrant articles. Majority vote required. The school board recommends this 700. The budget committee recommends this 700. Estimated net temp tax impact is $8.17 a thousand for Brookline, $5.18 a thousand for Hollis. Moved by Darlene Mann, seconded by Holly Durlo Babcock, Ms. Mann. So the budget, beginning, the budget committee begins its budget process um, in September of the school year. The administration begins working on things over the summer. Um, and by October of the school year, the budget committee is working on putting together what we like to call guidance. So guidance is a target budget um, that we put forward and present to the administration and it's something for them to work toward. Um, to establish that guidance, we look at economic and financial factors, assumptions, and in this case for the upcoming budget uh, for FY25, we applied a 1.3% increase to approximately 60% of the budget, the previous year's budget. So um, it was not applied to the entire budget. It was um, a, a rate reduced that was at the time half of the CPI that we were looking at at that time of year. Um, after putting that guidance forward, the administration came back and submitted a budget that was $13,000 below guidance. And that is the, uh, pr the budget that's being presented this evening for operating our operating budget, which represents a 5.2% increase above the current operating budget. 
I'm looking at the four main categories that are lead, uh, contributing to that increase include staff changes, which would be an addition of two paraprofessionals to support special education students. We have various maintenance and safety items like the data, well, kind of uh, general day-to-day -day operational um, updates for maintenance like paint, ceiling tiles, floor replacement, door replacement, restroom repairs. Um, those kind of general building maintenance items. We have updates to security cameras and some uh, paving and um, uh, sidewalk improvements uh, here at the high school. One of the other things included in our maintenance list is the conversion of Hollisbrook on High School to propane. Um, this is a kind of remnant from last year's uh, project that was put forward and failed at this meeting. A facilities committee has been meeting throughout the year to reevaluate how to meet the um, maintenance and upgrades that are necessary, and they're putting forward the HBHS conversion um, to propane boilers. Burners, propane burners. Um, we also have technology um, purchases in the budget, which include Chromebooks, staff um, laptops in addition to engineering laptops for our students and interactive flat panels. These are things that um, are replacements due to end of life um, of our existing equipment. On the academic side, we're looking at uh, textbook replacements um, that are in a, a, a much reduced cycle um, compared to prior years, but we still do have some. Some additional online subscriptions, uh, resources to support the behavior and mental health needs of our students, um, replacement supplies for music and world languages. To go through some of the major increases and decreases, um, one of the leading um, increases in the budget is uh, the increase in the guaranteed maximum rate for health coverage. So we're looking at an 18.7% increase in rates, which would be an additional $604,000 added to the budget. We see some program changes in addition to the two power professionals, uh, which was, is an incremental 207,000, have some additional field maintenance of 25,000. Those laptops that I mentioned is an additional 42,000. The facilities that are listed for 350 is that propane burner conversion I just mentioned. And the other academic program changes, there's some uh, revisions to the stipend structure for our staff and some additional software upgrades, and those would be about 407,000. We do see some savings across professional development and are uh, realigned that budget item to fall more closely to where actuals of the prior year fell, and that results in a reduction of $14,000 in professional, um, professional development. And as I said, while we do have some replacement textbooks in the budget, overall the textbook line is down by $60,000. Thank you. Mr. Power. Yes, Eric Power, Westview Road, Brookline. I'd like to make a motion to amend. Motion to amend. Please go ahead. Uh, to change the operating budget number to a new figure of 27,323,296. Got it. Is there a second? Yes, sir, your name? Dave Carey. Dave Carey? Perry, right. Mr. Power. Yes, I'd like to speak to the motion. Yeah. Um, this is a reduction of about $735,000 from the proposed budget. This is a 2.6% from what the, uh, was proposed here. And it's still an increase of 2.5% over last year. This amendment um, primarily cuts areas of new items, equipment, and clubs. No cuts to special education or textbooks. And um, we have a number of new clubs proposed. We have an enrollment that's steady to declining. I don't think we need to be adding more clubs with more stipends. Um, we also are um, 
spending money on engineering laptops over $40,000 if I recall correctly and flat panels $30,000 for cool cool down zones there's a lot of spending in here that I don't agree with I've communicated that to the budget committee and they still put it in there so we are getting killed with taxes you can see up here in Brookline this is eight dollars and seventeen cents per thousand that's a lot of money that we have to pay in taxes and I think just a little bit of a reduction to slow the spending would be greatly appreciated by the taxpayers we can postpone a few of these new items while giving you know do, doing at least half of them with this very modest decrease so I would recommend voting yes on this amendment thank you is there discussion on the amendment my name is Jim Gill I rise in support of the amendment and I do so I was thinking about for the teachers, I'm biased. My wife was a great speech therapist in a public school system for almost 40 years. And I would watch her come home at four or five o'clock at night and then stay up till midnight filling out IEP reports and all this paperwork to make sure her children were uh, taken care of. None of that factored in. And I saw that with my own eyes for a lot of so the teachers, I, I'm, I'm good. It's like the front line, police and fire. I'm good with that. Where I'm not good is a lot of this facility stuff where I see the, the pork coming in. We're going to convert this system. It's like last year I had asked a question regarding some, you know, changing oil lines and tanks and everything. And the question was, you know, did, so, did somebody say that that's leaking or it's going to, you know, or is it, would it be nice to have? And it was a lot of money turned out that they didn't do it last year. And what's really driving me is I went to a school in Lowell High School that used to be a county prison in 1850. The place was stone. It still had a lot of, I'll spare the details. The irony is 99% of us went on to college from that hellhole, right, physically. I come in here and I look at it and I go, this is a Taj Mahal. The kids, we used to running track, shovel the walkway in the back of the building in the dead of winter and went to track, the track team did. And if you didn't get all the ice when you were running, you'd wipe out and take a nasty spill. And that was just part of playing track and so forth. I think there's a mentality that in the facilities with this $28 million and everything, we gotta have a new roof. Well, maybe the roof goes five years while everybody's taxes are going up. Maybe we hold off and see if that makes it. Uh, you know, there's a lot of money in this operating budget that I say, hey, this is a Taj Mahal of public facilities from my perspective. Growing up in Lowell, I've been in this town for 30 years. And the students, I want to have them great experiences, great teams, great teachers. The human side of it, the facility side of it, I want everybody to shop in their pens and, and understand that sometimes when kids don't have the best material and facility stuff, they get kind of a little edge in them. They're a little bit more competitive. They don't have to be treated like a French poodle in order to be successful in life. Thank you. Ms. Farid. Tammy Farid Hollis. Um, to the point uh, the uh, individual made uh, who moved this amendment, if you cut any money out of this budget based on line item identification, there is no way to force the school district to um, withhold expenditures on the items that were men listed in the, um, in the uh, support for that amendment. Isn't that correct? Yes, unless you zero out a line item in the MS 27 or 737, um, it affects the dot bottom line, but the school board can move money around as they choose. So if, if um, and these kinds of gestures have been made in the past over the years, you cut out $700,000, it does not at all oblige in any legal or other fashion the school district to not spend money on the items that were listed during the discussion. Those Correct. items could still be fully covered and other th items could suffer depending on the district's identification of need. Isn't that correct? Correct. Thank you. 
Yes, ma'am. Becky Kellner, 7 Yankee Way. Um, I do not support the amended uh, operation budget because it doesn't allow you to hand pick what line item you don't want to be paid for. And I just wanna say that we vote for board members and committee members to be representative of what um, our town wants. And clearly the proposed original operating budget is supported by both of those entities. So please do not support the amended operational budget. Yes, ma'am. Lynn Powers, Parker Road, Brookline. Um, I stand here as a real estate agent in town, all right? I frequently move people here to Brookline and Hollis. Um, on average, and I'd say exceedingly so, the vast majority of people that I move here in town move here for the schools, period. Um, and on a non-anecdotal discussion, the um, National Bureau of Economic Research has, has equated $1 of state funding to $20 of property value. So it feels a little bit like we're cutting our nose off to spite our face, right? You drop the, the price, the funding of what you're supporting our schools, and you're going to eliminate your property value. So uh, $1,000 here, $1,000 there is gonna take $100,000 out of your property value. I think it's worthwhile consideration, um, and that's my piece, so thank you. It's now time to vote on the amendment. <clears throat> the amendment is to reduce the, val the, the, the uh, amount being raised and appropriated from 28 million and stuff to $27,323,296. If you are in favor of the amendment, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the amendment fails. <clears throat> is, there, what? is there discussion on the budget? Seeing none, it's time to vote on the budget. If you are in favor of the operating budget of $28,058,084, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the ayes have it. Which ones? Motion is... Two and three. The, mo one and <laughs> the motion is to restrict reconsideration of articles one and three. If you are in favor of re restricting reconsideration, raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, raise your cards. And the ayes have it. All right, I have the results of Article 2. Yes, 352. No, 113. Motion to restrict reconsideration of Article 2, made by Darlene Mann, seconded by Mr. Harris. If you are in favor of restricting reconsideration of Article 2, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the ayes have it. Article 2. 
Article 4. I don't like this clicker. Is the SAU budget. Now, this is another ballot vote by law. I would like to remind people that on, on most ballot votes, including this one, the polls are only open as long as it takes for everybody in the room to actually vote. I would also like to remind people that you only get to put in one ballot. You don't get to take your neighbor's ballot and stuff it in so they don't have to go and wait in line. You get to put in only one ballot in the box. Shall a district vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $1,169,828 as the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District's portion of the SAU budget of $2,377,762 for the forthcoming school fiscal year? This year's adjusted budget of $2,356,823 with $1,159,526 assigned to the school budget of this school district will be adopted if the article does not receive a majority vote of all the school district voters voting in this school administrative unit. The school board recommends this 700. The budget committee recommends this 700. The estimated net tax impact is 28 cents a thousand for Hollis, 44 cents a thousand for Brookline. Moved by Kate Stahl, seconded by Krista Whalen. Mr. Mann. I'll just uh, cue you to advance the slide. That's fine. Got a couple of introductory stuff to do. The polls are not open yet, just so you know. We get to discuss this first. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for attending tonight uh, and participating in the future direction of the co-op. I'm Robert Mann. In addition to serving on the co-op school board, I also uh, was appointed to the, um, as treasurer on the uh, SAU governing board. The SAU governing board is a governing body overseeing SA41, its administrators and staff. As treasurer, my role was to lead the committee that built the proposed FY25 budget. The committee worked from October to December, uh, or comprised of administrators, school board, and budget committee members to bring the draft budget to the SAU governing board for review and approval. Once approved, we held a public hearing in early December to present this budget to the community for public feedback and deliberation. Tonight, Article 4 is the culmination of that work. You could advance. Drew, advance, please. This year, for your consideration, uh, this is the, pro uh, the proposed uh, FY25 um, budget is $2,377,762. This represents an increase totaling 113,388, or 5%. The main drivers of the increases are related to salaries and benefits. For salaries of $81,980 is comprised for money to fund um, end of year merit pool, as well as uh, board approved additions to the budget of FY24 for salaries and also provides a 3% salary increase for FY25. For benefits of a $70,839 increase, that compromises increases to taxes and retirement contributions to the salary changes above an 18.7% increase in health insurance, and a 47 increase in dental insurance. If the proposed FY25 budget is not approved by the combined affirmation vote of Brookline, Hollis, and the co-op districts, the FY25 adjusted budget of $2,356,823 
representing a $20,934 reduction will be applied. Please support Article 4. Is there any discussion on Article 4? Yes, ma'am. Susan Do Haight. Do you have a voting card? Oh. Thank you. Susan Haight, um, South Main Street in Brookline. I have a general question on the budget for the SAU. I don't, I have not seen, and maybe it was at the discussion meeting, 2023 and what the actual, the budget and what the actual was and if there's a residual. So are you asking if there was a surplus from yes, last yes. year's budget? Yes, is there any money that was in the 2023 pr proposed budget that has not been spent? Did we have a surplus? Working. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure what the actual. There, <clears throat> unlike the school budgets, it can't be returned back, so it's kept as a uh, as a as a fund balance. And yes, there was some some balance. We ha there's guidelines of how much is supposed to be kept and how much uh, how much can be spent, and we use part of it to fund some one-time expenses. Um, I don't have the, the SAU budget for the previous. Are you talking about two years ago? We're no, I'm talking about the budget that was proposed for 2023 and how much of that has not been spent and can be applied towards 2024. Well, we're in 2024 right now, so it's 2025 that we're proposing, but I, so I think you're saying what's in the current year? Yeah, is there anything left over from from the current budget that can be applied to the well, next budget. Well, that doesn't budget. end until July, but there is a projection. Um, do, you, Darling, do you know what that number is? Is Kelly still, Kelly, do you know what the, pro, do you know what the projected is? Hopefully this will clarify for you. Um, in FY23, we had a surplus of 64,744. This year we're using $57,000 from that surplus to offset the budget. So the budget that you have in front of you has $57,000 that's funded through last year's surplus. So the proposed budget for the next year has been reduced by 57,000. Excuse me? The proposed budget that you're asking us to vote on has been reduced by 57,000. Correct, whether you pass the operating or the adjusted, 57,000 is being used to offset that. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Seeing no further, oh, Mr. Power. Yeah, Eric Power, Westview Road, Brookline. I just wanted to mention that the, this SAU budget keeps getting larger and larger every year. Um, it was up about almost 8% last year. We're seeing another at least 5%. And um, I like our superintendent, but he's paid number two in the state out of 133 superintendents, including all the large cities. So we are spending quite a bit of money for the superintendent. Um, and th this, this SAU just keeps spending more and more money. It gets distributed to the co-op primarily, but Brookline pays part of it in Hollis, and we get to vote on that. And um, in Brookline, our Brookline Finance Committee did not recommend this uh, Warren article. They're looking at the same exact Warren article that you see here. So. Please take that into account as you vote. I appreciate that. I'm voting no. Ms. Roy. Carol Roy, South Merrimack Road, Hollis, New Hampshire. 
The school administrative unit 41 is basically equivalent to a $50 million corporation comprised of three separate businesses with six different employment contracts. We are actually running incredibly lean. And yes, our superintendent is paid well. He has paid what he deserves. He's also retiring at the end of next school year. So you may see a difference in that going forward. Regardless of that, we have to be able to keep all three of those business units, our three school districts, Hollis, Brookline, and Co-op going. We are doing it very well with a relatively small staff. So I vote absolutely yes for the SAU budget. We got to keep it going and keep the goodness good. Thank you. Seeing no further discussion, it is time to vote. This is a ballot vote. A simp it, 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 the final result is a, the addition of the yeses and nos of all three districts. The polls will only remain open while people in the room are voting. The polls are now open on Article 4.
Is there anyone in the room who still needs to vote on Article 4? Seeing none, it is time to close the polls on Article 4. Article 5, the School Building and Facilities Maintenance Expendable Trust Fund, to see if the school district will vote to raise and appropriate up to the sum of $300,000 to be added to the previously established School Building and Facilities Maintenance Expendable Trust Fund, the sum to come from the Hollis Brookline Cooperative School District's June 30th, 2024 unassigned ba fund balance available on July 1, 2024. Majority vote required. School board recommends 700. The budget committee recommends 700. The net tax estimated tax impact is zero. Profession uh, potential foregone tax reduction of 11 cents a thousand for Brookline and seven cents a thousand for Hollis. Moved by Kate Stahl, seconded by Krista Whalen. Ms. Durlow Babcock. The school building and facilities maintenance expendable trust was established previously to help defray the costs of big ticket maintenance items. The purpose of this standalone account is to segregate funds for some of the major maintenance needs and to allow carryover to spread costs over multiple budget cycles. This fund alleviates the existence of major financial spikes due to non-routine maintenance costs. The funding source of this article is the unassigned fund balance or surplus that may exist at the end of the current fiscal year, June 30th, 2024. If surplus funds are not available, this article will not be funded. There is a process or oversight of this fund. Um, major expenditures are proposed by the administration to the school board. The school board then evaluates and holds a public hearing and then the school board will vote to make a final approval of the expenditure. Fund utilization. So here's a list of potential maintenance projects that are not included in the operating budget. There are $535,000 of highest priority facility maintenance items included in the operating budget. The items listed here are items that need to be taken care of if this article passes, if we have a surplus, and if they are approved by the school board after a public hearing. Some of those items include um, a front sidewalk at the Hollis Brookline Middle School, which is a $60,000 estimate, the high school elevator, phase one of three, $65,000 estimate, the high school roof, phase nine, $80,000 estimate, and the high school back entrance renovation at $105,000. And that's it. All done? Yeah, I finished. Any discussion on Article 5? Can I have the clicker, please? You need the clicker. I, I need the clicker, <laughs> just in case. Thank you. Seeing none, it is time to vote on Article 5. If you are in favor of $300,000 for the school building and facilities maintenance expendable trust fund, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, raise your cards and the ayes have it. If there is a Kenneth Nutter in the house, I have your voting card. Article six. <clears throat> Contingency fund. To see if the school district will vote to establish a contingency fund for the current year for unanticipated expenses that may arise and further to raise and appropriate $125,000 to go into the fund. This sum to come from unsigned fund balance available on July 1st, 2024 and no amount to be raised by taxation. 
Any appropriation left at the end of the year will lapse to the general fund. Majority vote required. School board recommends 700. Budget committee recommends 700. Estimated net tax impact is zero. Potential foregone tax reduction of three cents a thousand for Hollis and five cents a thousand for Brookline. Moved by Kate Stahl, seconded by Krista Whalen. Ms. Derlow Babcock. Can you just move the slide one? Thank you. The purpose of the contingency fund is to cover unanticipated major expenses that might arise during the school year. For example, this is an example we give often, the funds might be needed to help defray the cost of an additional classroom teacher if there was a dramatic increase in summer enrollment or to help to defray the cost of an unexpected maintenance need such as a broken elevator. The source of this funding is also the unassigned fund balance or surplus and unused funds are intended to fund the following year's contingency fund. That's it. Thank you. Is there a discussion on Article 6? Mr. Scales. So I'm a little confused. This is some sort of creative bookkeeping that uh, I'm not quite following. Um, modulo articles that are coming up before us later, the school board already has the ability to retain um, funds from the unassigned fund balance from one year to the next. Um, at which point they would become part of the following year's unassigned fund balance. So what we're doing here is we're grabbing 125k from the unassigned fund balance and hanging on to it so that we can dump it back into the unassigned fund balance, which I think we can do anyway. So why do we have this article before us? I think part of it is triggered by the Petition Warren article, among other things, that if we were to, uh, depending on how things go, we're not sure what funds we'll have available to us, and this allows us to clearly retain it for a defined purpose. Um, if, it's if, not much of a definition. No, as it, well, it's defined in the sense of there is a defined amount and a defined place as opposed to it just being the unassigned fund balance which depending on other articles might have to by vote be returned all right thank you mr power yes i had a question about this warren article um i know it's one hundred twenty-five thousand dollars from the unexpended fund balance if it exists be funded um, after the 300,000 because we're taking it up in that order. But I also looked in the budget and we have an we have an account on bud budget page 13, 10.2310.840.00 is a contingency fund already in the budget. Is that the same thing or do we have two contingency budgets? 125 plus another potential 125. Can anybody answer that question? What, what is that line number that's the account 10 this is a, this is a continuation of that one so if that one were not spent it at the end of the year goes into the unassigned fund balance and then this takes it back out and it essentially continues that 125 that that balance going through success the successive year so you're waiting for one hundred twenty five thousand dollars potentially out of this year, and you built in 125 into the next fiscal year's budget? We so. want to have 125 contingency. So we've got one in the current budget. If it goes unused, it lapses. This would take it back out and give it to us again next year. I thought, it looks to me like you have, you could have 125 from the FY24 that we're in, and then you've just raised and appropriated in the operating budget another 125 so we would have this kind of 200 are you talking the new budget or the old budget i'm talking there's both here one is retaining from this year's budget and the, there's 125 for next year's budget the 125,000 is not included in the operating budget that was presented by article three so it's, it was, it it's was treated completely separately from an from an appropriation perspective so even though it's listed in the budget it wasn't really in the budget 
Correct. Okay. I just the the because when we when we when we list all 850 lines in the budget, everything is included, and parts of it are broken out. So part there's a part for the operating budget, there's a part for separate warrants, and things like that. That are that are that are approved outside of the operating budget. So the, that line, the budget doesn't have everything added up into the one we just passed in Article Three. You're saying yeah. this this one got pulled out as a separate article. Yes. Okay. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is we we're going to decide in Article Seven if we want to continue to let the school board retain about two and a half percent of the net assess net assessment. And that would be another contingency fund. My estimate, I think it's about $518,000. So how many of these contingency funds do we really need? So um, vote accordingly. Thank you. Tammy, Ms. Fareed. Tammy Fareed Hollis. Um, a million years ago when I first started attending school board meetings, uh, the contingency was a line item that got just as much debate as it does in this setting. Uh, over the years, at some point, I think Andy might remember, but certainly Kelly will, it was pulled out and made its own warrant article. I'm probably wrong, but I thought there was an RSA that required that. Am I mistaken? Mike Harris, that, who serves on the Hollis Budget Committee, is recalling the same, that at a certain point there was a legislation passed that required uh, school districts at least, I, I think also towns, to pull out the contingency line item into its own warrant article so that the public can debate it under its own uh, steam and then decide it separate from the operating budget. If I'm mistaken, I hope someone will speak up, but I, please Mike remembers. Um, to the point of the question before me and the answers that were given, um, this is a budget item that lapses if it's not spent or if some of it's not spent, it lapses to the general fund from the current year, and this article would reappropriate for it. What Mrs. Mann was describing is, and the pages you see in your book are accounting, not se segregated out by warrant articles. So accounting books don't segregate monies out by warrant articles. They're just a holistic view of the entire budget. Seeing no further discussion, we have time to vote on Article 6. If you are in favor of appropriating $125,000 to go into a contingency fund, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, raise your cards. And the ayes have it. I have the vote here from Article 4. Yes. These are, these are the co-op only votes. Yes, 196, no, 58. The vote at the Brookline School District, which was taken on election day, was yes, 350, no, 467. The vote at, at the Hollis school, Hollis school District meeting was yes, 76, no, 27. When you add it all up together, the yeses are 622 and the noes are 552 and the SAU budget passes. <laughs> Ms. Brown. I move to restrict reconsideration on articles seven and six. Motion to restrict consider reconsideration article by articles six and seven. Is that correct? I, I think it would be article Five and six, it would be the SA, I uh, five and six. Five and six is the, we got each other's back. Nice try. You had mine the other night, I got yours now. <coughs> you can't, you can't, yes, you can. Try four, five, six, we haven't voted on seven. Seven is, seven is, we haven't done seven yet, Darlene. Right. So let's be clear. The motion is to restrict reconsideration of articles four, five, and six. Is that correct? Made by Mr. Harris, seconded by, I'll by second Ms. It. Roy. Oh. Ms. Roy. 
If you are in favor of restricting reconsideration on Articles 4, 5, and 6, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, raise your cards, and the ayes have it. Ms. Brown. Mr. Moderator, I would like to make a motion to suspend and postpone Articles 7, Just 8. one at a time. Just one at a time. Really? Really one at a time. Okay, Mr. Moderator, I would like to make a motion to suspend and postpone Article 7. No, you cannot remove to adjourn. No, we have to play this game, unfortunately, one by one. Yes. <laughs> All right, moved by Ms. Ms. Brown. Is there a second? Ms. By, second by Ms. Fareed. This is a two-thirds vote. If you are in favor of suspending and postponing Article 7, please raise your cards. Thank you. If you are opposed, please raise your cards. And the ayes have it. See, that wasn't too painful. Okay, so Mr. Moderator, I would like to make a motion to suspend and postpone Article 8. Yes, I'll be happy to advance the slides. Okay. All right, motion to suspend and postpone Article 8 is by Ms. Brown, seconded by Mr. Harris. Again, a two-thirds vote. If you are in favor of suspending and, and postponing Article 8, please raise your cards. If you are opposed, please raise your cards, and the ayes have it. Again, Mr. Moderator, I would like to make a motion to suspend and postpone Article 9. We've already done Article 9. Dear that God, 10? <laughs> 7? We did, did we did 7? We've, so there's, we've three done, motion, there's three PWAs, seven, eight, and nine. And we've done them all. Thank goodness, nine already failed. I would like to take this moment to announce that it is past 11.06 p.m. Eastern Time. It is now spring. And well past my bedtime. Uh -huh. would I, can I make a motion to dissolve the meeting? Yes, you may. Second by Ms. Vareed. All in favor of dissolving the meeting, raise your cards. Thank you. All opposed. And the ayes have it. This motion is, this meeting is dissolved.